and Muzz got mad at me, the coach said, he goes, Jesus Christ, why don't you just wear two nines? And I went, okay. Please, please, please never do that. Yep. So, hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 468 of Spittin' Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. What is up, everyone? November is already here. We have a few surprise teams, a front office shakeup, and a bunch more to get to. But first, we say hello to the fellas, producer Mikey Grinelli. What's shaking? You got a little something up your sleeve, I hear? Chicklets U, what's this all about? Chicklets University is coming to the Spit and Chicklets YouTube channel November 15th. Uh, it's a video series. We've been filming it for a few months now. I'm very excited about it. As you guys know, I've been kind of the college hockey guy on this show for a while now. Um, but we're going around to a bunch of different arenas all across America. We're checking out their facilities, the good, the bad, the ugly. We're very excited. Uh, and we're starting off with the 2021 national champions and Greg Carvel and the University of Massachusetts next Wednesday. So we're very excited for that. Taylor McCarr gave us a tour of the facilities. Incredible, incredible facilities. I did say in the video, uh, the nicest facilities in North America. I feel like North Dakota fans are going to be coming at me for that one. They do have the Ralph, but very excited for this series to kick off. Hopefully, we can get Wit and BU involved. Absolutely. Great I job, saw, G. I I saw saw a couple clicks this, for G, boys. couple clicks couple, for G great here. Great job, G. Pew, 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 pew. Very excited. That I'm very excited, years, buddy. Now, uh, just to clarify, you said on the Spit and Chicklets YouTube channel. Now, how many followers does that channel have exactly? 303,000, baby. We have, I wait, feel wait like a minute. 3,000 in a week is actually probably the biggest week we've ever Jeez, had. I, I mean, I wonder why we, we gained that many fucking followers in, in a week's time. What do you, what do you think it could be? Uh, I don't know, but maybe we lost 3,000 downloads after them listening to you say it over and over in the car. <laughs> so who knows if it was even a win, Biz? <laughs> okay, yeah, it all evens out in the wash now, doesn't it? Could be and the return of game notes, home, too. Biz uh, has a little internet issue, so he actually can't see us right now, which actually I love because me, R.A., and Grinelli could maybe just give him the finger when we want to. <laughs> kind of like my see. career, Wit. I don't have any vision, right? Just, hey, I don't know. I wouldn't I got say the vision was on. something you were lacking. <sighs> Narrow it right in. Put the blinders on, folks. You had vision for the after-hours parties, and that's what's most important sometimes. We need some teams to maybe have a couple of those right now. But one thing I am good at is feeling out the rhythm of conversation here on the podcast, so I'm going to jump in when I feel it's right, and so far, not too bad with not being nope. able to see you guys. No, nope. We'll make it work, buddy. Yeah, I, I saw a chick at University. I was hoping to get another seven years of college tucked in, but probably not going to happen <laughs> with this fight. <but>. Van <laughs> Wilder. <laughs> Next up, the wit dog, Ryan Whitney. What's shaking, my man? Not much. Uh, not much at all. Hell of hell of a week, boys. I mean, we had the sandbagger drop, which was great. We'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, a lot of great feedback. That was a lot of fun. Thanks to Noah Hannafin, Jack Eichel. Uh, myself this weekend, uh, a monster college hockey series at Aganis Arena on Com Ave in Boston. North Dakota came to town to take on uh, the Terriers. And BU won the first game, uh, unbelievable game on Friday night, and then tied the second game. They, they technically lost in a shootout, but for pairwise rankings and the NCAA tournament later in the year, it counts as a tie. Um, unreal hockey. Like, I, I, I'll say this right now, and Canadian people, you may not want to hear it, but it used to be the old, like, OHL, WHL, best teams playing the best college hockey teams. College hockey teams would slaughter junior hockey teams now and it is more a, a, a case of OHL teams and WHL teams are probably competing more with USHL teams because you see the talent um Macklin Celebrini who will be the first overall pick this year monster weekend took an enormous headshot actually from a guy Schmaltz on North Dakota on uh Saturday night and he Didn't was right back the out there which was awesome yeah right back out there for the five minute power play interestingly enough the guy got a five minute major but he didn't get kicked out of the game I thought it was I guess they, the ref can choose if you get um tossed and the five minute major what's up buddy uh and and and, and he wasn't so I'm saying hi to my son hey, hey I'm working get out of here get out of here uh so <laughs> Um, what was I saying? So Celebrini was a monster, and actually two players on North Dakota really stood out. One is this kid, Jackson Blake, whose father was Jason Blake, played in the NHL a long time, 
Carolina got this kid in 2021 in the fourth round. Game breaker. He scored the OT winner. I said shootout. He was overtime. He scored a beautiful OT winner. And then he fucking went on his knees and skated right in front of the BU bench. So the boys will have to remember that if they meet in the national What do you mean? What do you mean? He he like did the, the Yakupov slide? He fucking skated into the corner. It was a beautiful goal. And he skated into the corner, slid on his knees at the blue line, and then slid in front of the BU bench looking at them the entire time. <laughs> and I immediately said, we'll remember that one come tourney time in March or April. Oh, yeah. So what that the was, fuck are you going to do? There's no fighting there. You're going to fucking punch him with your glove hey, on? It, 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 it could maybe, be, it could maybe um, make you a little extra motivated in terms of, I'm not going to lose to North Dakota and watch this kid slide in front of our 25 years old playing university hockey and can't fight. No, this kid's not 25, so a hell of oh, a okay. player. And then they got this Jaden Perron kid who Carolina got last summer in the third round. So two, like, super skilled, a, a little smaller, but not tiny by any means, uh, right right shot forwards, game breakers. And this Perron kid, his shot was a joke. He scored a beauty Saturday night. Actually, Celebrini and Perron played together last year on the Chicago Steel in the USHL, lit that league up. So it was an awesome weekend for BU to get a win and technically a tie. Uh, and great games. I brought Ryder in Saturday night. He had a blast. S Friday night, I sat with um, Chris Bork, who also helps out with BU hockey, uh, and Reed Mitchell. This guy... What a legend. Apparently, he's worked for the Toronto Maple Leafs for 24 years. And I don't know his exact title, but a great storyteller, an awesome dude. So I got to spend some time with him, asking him, you know, different thoughts about the league and the Leafs, which, you know, that's that's a private conversation. But the guy, the guy was awesome, uh, a true kind of lifer in the game of hockey. And to to be with the Leafs that long with all the changeover just shows how how valuable he is to that organization. So overall, an awesome weekend. And uh, we had a fun Halloween. So was that? No, that was two weeks ago. Jesus Christ. Um, but. I got nothing else, guys. I got nothing else. I mean, I'm now, getting ready for to, our trip. I, I just want to defend the uh, the CHL, the Canadian Hockey League. Now, it is a lot younger than university hockey. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. But, so, so obviously, the players, in like, if you put a university team against an OHL team or a Western Hockey League team, obviously, the university is going to win. But to be fair... I feel like over the course of the last five to 10 years, university hockey has gotten f like far better. And, and maybe that is because those are the years it's become older, Biz. What do you mean? It's, it's more recent that a lot of teams are making kids go to play junior two years Sometimes one, oftentimes two years before they come in as a freshman. That is within the last five to 10 years. So I think the argument beforehand had a little bit more weight because like, the ages were somewhat similar. Now there are a lot of 23, 24, and sometimes 25-year-old guys, so it does make sense. So you have to be a special player to be playing college hockey at the earliest would be, what, 18 years old? So Celebrini, which is like... Celebrini turned 17 in June. So if you look at what he's doing, he has 14 points in eight games. The fact he's even playing college hockey is out of control. And then he'll be drafted after his freshman year. So similar to... Uh, Jack Eichel and Charlie McAvoy, also be you guys. They, but they, the September 15th is the cutoff for the draft, right? So last year it was, I believe, 06s who got drafted. If you're born in 06 after September 15th, you will be the next draft, okay? Well, Eichel and, and, and McAvoy, they were like October or November. Celebrini is June into the next year. So, like, he's going to get drafted after just turning 18. So, to see him even playing college hockey and dominating, it, it, it is pretty incredible. And, like, in a similar fashion, like, um, this stud, uh, uh, Pavel Mintyakov in Anaheim that we'll talk about, right? I hope I said his last name right. He actually was drafted a year later than most kids his birth year because he was he's a November birth date. So it, it does kind of put to, into context what Celebrini's doing. Turning 17 in June and playing college hockey in itself is a big deal. To dominate is is out of control. Do you think that makes him more inclined to come back next season, especially because so. his, his buddy Cole I hope Eiserman's so. And coming. if the Sharks win the lottery, <laughs> fuck yeah, he'll be staying. <laughs> Would you want to go to that right now? <laughs> we'll um, I was going to ask. So the, the, the guy who's been with the Leafs for 24 years, what's the name again? Reed Mitchell. How many how many crazy stories did he have from behind the scenes of stuff that like almost went down or didn't went didn't go down in, in Leafs world? 
Um, we didn't really maybe talk about Leafs World in, st- in terms of what went down and what didn't go down. He told me a couple things uh, that I can't repeat that were p- were pretty pretty interesting. I'll say that um, in terms of just like over the years, all the different stories, but nothing like that. I was like totally you know blown away at. More just the guy's an unreal storyteller, good guy, and you could see why he stayed around that that organization for that long. That's awesome. Last but not least, even though he's already talked quite a bit, Paul, biz nasty, biz net, looks like you're back down Atlanta, but you had a very exciting weekend. You must have been fired up. You were on Hockey Night in Canada for the first time. How excited were you? Were you more nervous? What? Let's hear it. Oh, I was nervous. It, it was a blast, and, and it was an honor, guys. I, I, I've been fortunate enough to be on hometown hockey. Um, I did the trade deadline at Sportsnet, but never had I done a Hockey Night in Canada broadcast and um, got the opportunity to do it because Bieksa was away. I think he was in Detroit, his his kid at a hockey tournament. So I was fortunate enough to fill the seat and just what a blast seeing these total pros go at it. And, you know, obviously I've been fortunate enough to work at TNT with a bunch of other unbelievable pros as well. Uh, I think that, you know, over the course of probably the season, you're averaging about, you know, six 600,000 to a, a million viewers, maybe on some, if you get like original six matchup on TNT, but I think in Canada, they're averaging about 3 million viewers over the course of the night with the East coast games and the West coast games. So just to get to, to work with Ron McLean, who's a, a Canadian icon, Canadian legend and, and a total pro, like I don't understand how he has the motor he has at how long he's been doing it in his age. Like, I guess no offense to like calling out his age, but like, he is just like the minute the lights go on, he's just like, and he could, and his memory guys, the stories and the names and the names. And like, I can't even get the players names of current NHLers, right? This guy is just humming them off. Doesn't skip a beat. Um, I actually got to go eat the night before because we were staying at the hotel with Kelly Rudy, a guy who's been doing Hockey Night in Canada for 25 years. Uh, I'd never hung out with him before. What a fucking beauty he is and, and a total pro as well. And then Elliot Friedman, who was not only doing the the TV, but just manning the phone the entire night, getting all these stories from behind the scenes. I don't know how this guy does it. Talk about Ron's motor. This guy's motor is an overdrive nonstop. Sportsnet, please get him a vacation. I uh, I just had some. He names better be on- making a million bucks. He be- because that guy is a machine. I think he's a he, machine. Uh, we talk about it later in the episode. The Trung fan. He Elliot Freeman might be AI. He might not be a, a, an actual human being. So there's that's still a, the book is still out on that. But as far as snap around the thank yous, uh, I want to thank Ed Hall, Brian Spear, Rob Corte, obviously Ron McLean, Rudy Friedman, Jen Botterill was there as well, who I get to work out at uh, work out with TNT. And then I had uh, Bieksa juice down uh, for giving up his seat for the night. And as I said, a true honor. It was fun snapping around with all the Canadian teams and uh, got a lot of positive feedback. So just extremely grateful and and it, uh, it was on my bucket list and, and grateful that I was able to accomplish that. So you dummy juice in the golf on the golf course, and then you steal his seat. Yeah. Just an interesting uh, an interesting little rivalry we have there, Bruin Biz. But I, it, I'm curious, because it's like Hockey Night in Canada, and even as an American, like I remember when I moved to Ann Arbor for the national program, like you would get CBC, like uh, Michigan would, I guess, and and watching it, it just it just meant a little bit more. So for you... Maybe the nerves a little bit more than a TNT broadcast just because you grew up watching it? Yeah, and, and it's your first time in that environment doing that as well, right? Where there's a different cadence to the broadcast where... And you um, can't talk about like some things you say on Somebody say, <laughs> somebody say cadence? <laughs> They're talking about oh, Wayne oh, doing yeah. shrooms might yeah. fly on Turner, but I don't know if uh, <laughs> Rogers or whatever C- C- CBC. CBC yeah, it's it definitely a little bit more buttoned up, and the, and the the biggest component to it too is is you got to make sure you're snapping it around evenly to each Canadian team, or then you're going to have those fans coming at you online. Which hey, they're, they're just passionate about hockey and they want to hear their teams being talked about. So on a broadcast in which um, we had three Canadian teams going at it in that early game, uh, our game was was Buffalo Toronto so that was great to talk about the Leafs um the, they had uh, St. Louis and Montreal were going at it uh, we got to talk about the Slavkovsky situation which that was that was national news in Canada about how they're managing him his ice time whether he should be sent down or not um and then the other one was 
Ottawa, <laughs> the Ottawa and Tampa Bay game, which ended up having tons of drama after it. And we'll get to that shortly. And then the late game, it was great because we got the zone in on one was Vancouver and Dallas. And that was for second place in the West. And it was awesome to get to watch that full game and comment on it and see how buttoned up that overall five on five team defense is for the, for the Vancouver Canucks. This team is fucking nasty. And I know they're not this, going anywhere, but they're not going anywhere. The way that their stars are playing and their goaltenders are and all their role guys, they are completely bought in. Uh, but it was, like I said, to go back to the broadcast, it, it was, you know, it was a little bit nerve wracking because you had to also bring that knowledge and uh, and make sure you knew what the fuck you were talking about. Because those Canadian fans, if you don't, will let you know online if you fuck up, especially if you call the the captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs, Jonathan Tavares, which uh, <laughs> John is not short for Jonathan. There is no I, that. I, I mean, I thought every John was a Jonathan. So <laughs> same I'm here. with you there, buddy. Same here. Like, I never even heard of that. <laughs> I remember finding out that people named Jack are named John. And I was oh, like, that, what? But I oh, guess some people aren't. Who knows? But my buddy, Jack, really, all of a sudden, one time, I found out his name was John. I was like, wait, what? Really? So you didn't, there's you some, didn't know there's that? Some, I'm surprised. I didn't know. Oh, yeah. yeah I oh. didn't know that. All right. Huh. Um, yeah, Biz, you did a great job. I got to check you out because I was at the BU game, but then I watched... Uh, I watched Van in Dallas and was watch. I wanted to see you on there. It was it was a lot of fun seeing you crush it, uh, just in another outlet. And and uh, I appreciate that wit and, and the boys for even bringing it up and allowing me to talk about this. Like the the coolest part about it was when we we wrapped up the show. Um, we went up to a pub and you know it, it was. I got to sit down with Ron McLean, Kelly Rudy, and Elliot Friedman and just have a little, you know, a little campfire, you know, story time and just to 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 hang out with those guys, legends of the game. Uh it was a it was a night I will never forget. Did you tell them that you recorded the whole conversation yet? Uh, I have not. No. no. Okay. So and, <laughs> they'll, they'll be in for that. That's going to get us a couple million downloads. There was a lot of we times. We might have 500K there, subscribers. Th there was definitely a few times where they say, hey, this is off the record, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so they reminded me. And I even got to keep this amazing souvenir that uh, Ron McLean gifted me. And I, I will not be putting this on eBay or selling it out of the trunk of my car. So this one's mine, folks. Before we go any further. I got to talk to you guys about Pink Whitney. Whew, is it making the rounds? I met a, a, a couple of um, former BU students that said, excuse me, are you Ryan Whitney? I said, yes. They said, Pink Whitney's our drink. We get absolutely in one on this drink. We have a bunch of people over. We all take some shots. And next thing you know, the party's ripping. And that's pretty funny because you have a chance to enter Maybe the biggest party or friend that you know. Somebody that's just the life of the party, that brings the noise, that brings the thunder, and they can win a trip to New York City. The Pink Whitney New York City trip. The ultimate life of the party nominee. Any one of your friends can be nominated, and you can hook up them and three of their buddies, which hopefully is you if you're the one nominating them, to come to New York City and check out the Barstool headquarters, meet some content people, see where all the magic happens, and get involved with Pink Whitney in New York City. And also, there'll be 10 secondary prize winners that will receive Pink Whitney party packs with everything you and your crew need to take your shot and throw the ultimate house party. It's easy to enter just go to pinkwhitney.com to enter all of your info nominate your life for the party friend and you got to describe how they always make the party next level so don't just say oh they're funny they tell good stories they're loud at parties maybe give some examples of things they've done in the past that have made numerous people laugh while they're partying and drinking their pink whitney so head on over to your local bar and order some pink whitney's first and second is go to pinkwhitney.com and nominate your buddy for the pink whitney new york city trip of a lifetime um, and then last thing I did forget to mention, I, I'm a dummy, but before we get into the rest of the show and starting with the Ottawa Centers and what's going on in, in Canada's capital is I went on uh, my good buddy Kirk Minahan show. I go on that, I'd say three to four times a year. And I mentioned on there that my wife is expecting. So there'll be a third Whitney crew joining the family early May. Um, I actually said it on, on Chicklets uh I don't know, two months ago. Oh, yeah. The and wife next I that. went downstairs. I said, hey, I just told everyone you're pregnant. She goes, she, she looked at me and said, are, are you fucking stupid? <laughs> you got me pregnant last night. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> so I had to text Grinelli to have it have it taken out. But um, crazy. I'm so excited. Being a dad is the best thing in the world. Uh, I don't know how the handicap will be in five years. But in terms of uh, 
in terms of like excitement and, and, and appreciate my wife. I mean, do it all, all three of her pregnancies, the first three months, she's been sick as a dog. So I think once women go through being pregnant, and, and dealing with the morning sickness and the nausea and then actually giving birth, they finally understand what it's like for a man to have a common cold. So we appreciate them. Um, I, I, I think that May will be a crazy time in my life with the playoffs and, and the birth of our third. We, we don't find out um, the sex uh, of the kid beforehand. So it'll be that, that crazy excitement surprise that we had with Ryder and Wyatt. Well, you did a hospital birth. You did a home birth. You think you could do a cere- ceremonial face-off and playoff birth? Maybe if, like a, if, a, a puck I drop? could guarantee the Oilers in the playoffs, <laughs> I, I'd have I'd have her just pushing out at the red line at the Rogers Center. Hey, I'll talk to the <laughs> TNT broadcast. You shaved my head. Now you get to do the the the, the arena birth. Biz, I'm down with anything. I'm okay. down. I'm down. All I want is a healthy baby, boy or girl. I don't care. Just a healthy baby, God willing. They're gonna put a piece of the umbilical cord in each of the Oilers guys' rings to uh, comm- <laughs> commemorate them. <laughs> Biz loves like. The birth related things he wants to eat placenta talking about the umbilical cord well, you got a little yeah, fetish he's there a sick, sick, yeah, puppy, I don't know right? yeah, I, I go off the rails knows. a little hey, bit I, I, had a, no I had to hold it all in for hockey night in Canada so I feel like I gotta <laughs> let it all out now <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I know I know I already said it, but to Sportsnet and everybody at Hockey Night in Canada, even the people behind the scenes uh, uh, a, a moment I will never forget so thank you guys so much a quick little tidbit on Notify Biz. If it's if a name is J O H N, it's usually just John. It's usually J O N that gets shortened from Jonathan. You know what I mean? Okay. Just well, a little heads up for I'm going to stick with Captain we'll Jonathan. I don't know about you guys. Uh, <laughs> it's my team. I can say whatever the fuck I want. <laughs> uh, wait, you just mentioned a uh, golf game. You guys, another victory in the sandbag. Hopefully, everyone out there watched it, but it was already on the internet. Guys, what, how many is that in a row? Is it 10? Ten. Ten? Double digits. Ten. That's double digits. Um, our next opponents, if we win this one, I, I think we may no, never lose again. And that is because we are playing two legends of the game, Jeremy Roenick and Timo Solani, next week in California. Roenick's a complete stick. Solani's good at everything in life, so I know he's solid. I think he might play a lot of tennis. I don't know how much golf he plays. I'm sure he gets his rounds in. But we're pretty much uh, we're facing maybe our toughest opponents we have in, in quite a while. Um, and, and we do have a tough time with retired guys opposed to these current young bucks. Well, that's because that all, that's all they do. Yeah, that's very true. So 10 in a row, thanks to Eichel and Hannafin. I mean, we dummied them. They didn't have their A game, either one of them. Uh, maybe Eichel should have got a few more shots. We dropped Biz's shots. People are still complaining. And for the first time and I was in a brutal. long time, Biz was horrible. Oh, you want me to keep talking? Oh, sorry. sorry, I needed that, a that, no, water. That, no, that's a result Body of me armor. not being able to. <laughs> that's a result of me not being able to see you guys. Uh, are we not going to mention the other match we have lined up? Because we have a a five day California trip in which we're going to do interviews. Uh, we do have a Pink Whitney event, a bottle signing, and an appearance. I think G is going to hit you with uh, the addresses and the times in which you guys in California, in the Anaheim area, can come check us out. Uh, and then we have a second sandbagger lined up against Kevin Connolly and Sean Avery. So we are going in prepared for full mental warfare. Yeah, that is going to be talk about off the rails. Oh, I don't and know. Avery's what Avery's like a fucking black belt now in jujitsu. So God knows I'm not saying shit to him, Biz. you can wrestle him like you wrestle Bugsy. I will I will be hiring security for that one. I'm going to bring a lawyer to hit him with an NDA beforehand. I am bringing out all the stops with Sean Avery that uh that guy is 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 uh, is is a sociopath. I think that's the is that the correct term for him? I heard I heard I'm Conley asking on, on their show um about like are you ready for this and he's like yeah, my game's unreal. And then he's like, do you have clubs? And he's like, I have top of the line clubs. So he's already like playing mental warfare with his partner. So God knows what he'll be trying to pull off with us. But I asked in him the his end, handicap wit. I asked his, he called me the other night during the sandbagger. And I, he asked, I asked him his handicap. Wouldn't tell me. He said, we'll discuss on site. Okay. He's like, okay, well, well, that, that will be crazy. But in my mind, like I can't even think about them yet. And it's back to back days, right? This is Monday, Tuesday of next week. And we got to record the pod right after the Team Mussolini Ronick one. So 
I can't even think about Conley and Avery until that match happens, and then, boom, that night my brain will turn over to Warfare Zone. So I think that the trip's going to be a success, hopefully, and the sandbaggers should be electric, but we got to try to continue this winning streak. And thanks to Eichel and thanks to Hanover for taking our beating. And, and the last thing here, um, if you don't know where to catch the sandbagger, um, it's on our Spit and Chicklets YouTube channel, which has 303,000 followers, G. And now you can let them know exactly where those events are in Anaheim so our fans can come out and see us. Yeah, so on Sunday, November 12th, we'll be from 12.30 to 2 p.m. We'll be at G&D Liquors at 338 North Usulid Drive in Fullerton, California. And then that same day, Sunday, November 12th, from 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m., we'll be at Danny K. Billiards and Sports Bar in Orange, uh, California. So very Orange excited County? for that. It just says, it Orange, Orange, it just says California. Orange, California. Oh, interesting. Okay, I didn't know they had a place called Orange. Biz, when you uh, going back to Arizona? All right, I, don't, I, I honestly don't know. It, feel, it feels like never. I've okay. just been traveling like a madman. But why do you ask about me going back to Arizona? Uh, well, if you were going to bump into uh, Logan Cooley, he owes me a, a shout out. He never, he didn't give me a shout out for the. Well, technically he, he doesn't. Technically he does not. All right, because he okay. had to score the next game. Okay, all right, and that he scored true, the game after he that. Ask, and what's crazy an is that night. He, it looked like he got one, like as it was crossing the goal line, but his, he just missed it on his stick. And I, I watched that game so um, attentively because I was like, oh my God, I need this Warthog shout out. And then sure enough, he gets another one or he gets his first the, the next game. So he didn't owe you the shout out uh, by the letter of the law, but I, I still was hoping for one, but I don't really blame him. He was probably, he was probably actually forgetting at that point because he was so excited, but what a player he is. And the, and the Yotes, they're playing some good hockey. Yeah, they are. Oh. They play their bags off for tourney. And and all right, if you wouldn't have watched that game, if you would have seen the the score at eight to one, you would have assumed oh. that he had one. But oh, he ended up getting it the the next game in Anaheim, and and it was a beauty. That move he pulled off was just whew, the 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 hands, the mitts on the kid, and that's I would say that that's what made the Slavkovsky stuff. Uh, national news is because Montreal went into Arizona shortly thereafter and then everybody's comparing the shiny new toy that the Arizona Coyotes have to that same draft where they ended up passing on Shane Wright taking Slavkowski and then and L Logan Cooley ends up dropping a three so I would say to summarize this this Calder race is a, a sick joke there are so many good young players in the league right now that have came in and dominated so far this year I know it's been a lot of Bedard talk but you talk about Cooley you talk about this kid in Anaheim who the defenseman is who I can't even say his fucking last name who's just buzzing up and down the ice and the list goes on and on and on Mintyukov it's Mintyukov his name is I, Mintyukov I, we can Mintyukov. talk about that later but in 15 years dude oh. Leo Carlson Ooh. I, I really really wouldn't be surprised if he is as dominant as Bedard. I, I think that sounds crazy right now. I think Bedard is a generational talent. I think this kid is Matt Sundin, and watching him out there, it's, it's, it's incredible. His size, his speed, the fact he's still growing, what a player. Incredible. Anaheim, dude. We'll get oh. into them when we go into the California. Yeah, we get into, so let's get all into that Ottawa. Yep. We got into game. the headline hogs. Game notes did return last week with Merles and Ami. If you if you didn't catch it, it's on our YouTube as well. They'll be every Thursday, eleven a.m. Check them out. Merles did the did the yeah, the degenerate along with Ami. Good stuff. But all right, Biz. You already mentioned Otto a couple times, so we might as well jump into them right now. Of course, uh, last week Shane Pinto got suspended for half the season. Uh, then last Wednesday, the league ruled the Senators will have to forfeit a future first round pick sometime in the next three years because they did not originally supply Evgeny Dadanoff's no-trade list to Vegas, and then Vegas later tried to trade him to Anaheim, and they couldn't because the uh, trade list issue came up. Later that day, the new owner, uh, Michael Anlauer, fired Pierre Dorian. See you later. I think people have been waiting that for a while. Uh, and Biz, I know we were talking the other day about trade calls and kind of all the stuff that goes on, and apparently the league office doesn't know about who's on what trade list or no trade list. It's a lot going on there, Biz. Didn't you get a little laugh? Okay. For us? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, me being the illiterate asshole, I when I saw the original tweet, I thought they had to give up three first rounders. I nearly shit a brick, but they get to pick which first rounder in 2024, 2025, and 2026 in which they want to give up when when they get the the list of the draft order starting in 2024, correct? Yes. It has to be within 24 oh, hours yeah. after the lottery is decided. Okay. So I will say I agree with the owner 
Ann Lauer by the fact that they didn't really disclose this and made it seem like it wasn't a big issue before he bought the team. So I wrote, this is insane. Well, one, because I thought it was three first overall picks. I thought they would have been a little bit more lenient, especially at the fact that he bought the team and had nothing to do with it. But then I ended up getting a text and to basically because of my tweet saying this, and I'm going to read it off. I'm not going to give out my source. I didn't realize how these calls went down, right? So this is a, a great breakdown as to why the the penalty is as severe as it is. Some people aren't listening right now are being like, no, they deserve to get penalized like that. Other who are Ottawa fans think they should have been lenient. Well, maybe you change your mind after I read this out. So this is from a, a, an unnamed source. So the trade call is sacrosanct. Never even knew that was a word. It is the judge and jury for all details surrounding a trade. Trade calls became necessary years ago as disputes would arise. So what is said on the trade call involves both teams as well as NHL central registry. You know how trade lists work. If you don't submit then on time, you will not have any protection for that year. You'd be amazed how often this happens. Ask Patrick Berglund. On the trade call, NHL central registry asks Dorian, does the player have a no trade list to which Dorian replied? No, he did not submit one. So that is gospel. The NHL proceeded based on this. And then the Vegas golden Knights pr- proceeded on that. That's why originally, if you can remember the NHL approved the trade because they were operating off the same information that they were that uh, Vegas was. Then the agent came forward with proof he had submitted that no trade list. So he provided that to Dorian in which Dorian didn't, yeah, that he didn't provide. I'm surprised uh, at the take on this as former players. Do you think that uh, it was right for Evgeny Dadanov to be traded when he had trade protection and he and his family had to go through this, then return to the same team? It's a serious transgression which deserves serious consequences. So after reading that, I'm like, well, it's just a kick in the dick for for this new owner for the Ottawa Senators to buy the team and get absolutely hammered with all this bullshit that's going on. And that was before the game on Saturday had been played in which the players got booed off the ice. They're calling for the coach's head. And then Brady Kachuk has to, in the media, in the post-game presser, tell the fans to back off and that it's bullshit they're coming after the coach. If you don't think this team is the Ottawa headline hogs right now, you're out of your fucking mind. This is the Kardashian family on acid. I love every second of it. They are now my fourth team. I am jumping on the Ottawa Senators bandwagon and keep in mind they are facing as much of adversity as any team if not more right now in the league probably more so than Edmonton and Toronto put together and what was the last thing I was just going to say about them I forgot I'll hand okay, it over well, to you well I, I'm pretty sure it's not Dorian on the call for that like, I, okay, I don't, so he, okay so here's another thing is they were a notoriously cheap organization where I don't think that there was a lot of people hired in places that should have been hired. And he was basically doing numerous jobs. And sometimes when you're juggling all this different shit, man, that's when more shit ends up happening. Okay. I I, I do agree with that. And Melnick, uh, we'll get into Dorian in a second. Now, in terms of the, the trade call and how it broke down, basically what, what the main issue was, besides the embarrassment for the league in which a player's traded, this news comes out, it sucks for the player, as your source told you. Like, all of a sudden, you got to go back to a team who tried to trade you. Your no trade list was made public, at least one of the teams, which players are pretty open about not wanting to share, right? Like, you don't want fan bases to know where you don't want to go. I think that's fair. But what happened was... The Ducks and the Golden Knights, they're the ones that are pissed off because they had, you know, they were getting a draft pick. They wanted the draft pick that they were going to get for Dadnov. And there's all these different things. So it's like, well, we're the ones getting hosed here on information we weren't given. Now, my thing is, and maybe I'm totally off base here, but with Central Registry and the league having every contract in place, like they can't do double checks in terms of like, all right, actually, like, there is a no trade list on this guy's Well, deal maybe that- we should double check too because we've said, I think, the Ducks and the Sharks. So who did he actually get traded to, Dad? He got traded. Vegas tried trading him to the Ducks. Okay. The Ducks were on his no trade list. 
my thing is like, do you not agree that almost like the NHL central registry should be looking at the contract too? It's like just it's it's another set of eyes so that this doesn't happen. I guess they're putting the onus on the teams, which I mean gives gives less of a job for all the 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 dealings with that 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 the NHL is doing with all these trades and signings. So I understand that, but I I was I was surprised that something like this could get through. Although your source says it happens a lot more than we think, so. It, it, it was just a brutal way for Ann Lauer. And, and I'll say this about him. If you're an Ottawa Senators fan, you got to be fired up because that is a press conference uh, that an owner gives that makes a fan base excited and happy yeah. because this guy's speaking up against the league. He's saying, listen, you didn't you didn't give me I, I was buying a car. And you didn't tell me that the engine's been replaced. Like, obviously, that's an exaggeration, but you didn't you didn't fill, fill me in. And then he goes on to say, well, he's, they're trying to get the most money for the seller. And, and that's a pretty damning statement uh, enough Whew. to enough of which I've read that, like, Bettman at, sh- at one point probably called him and said, like, hey, I don't know if he got a pee-pee whack as much as he would have if he hadn't just gotten fucked over by the league as much <laughs> as he did. But you're not able. I mean, this is like it's it's the silence in this league, right? We got like, Ann Lauer speak- versus Bettman in, in a rough and rowdy, and we got the undercard of Brady and DJ Smith going against the, the fans who are booing. This is fucking heating up, baby. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a drama-filled <laughs> team, and they're off to another horrible start, dude. They're okay. off to a start, which this is the starts under DJ Smith. 2019, 2020, 8, 11, and 1 in their first. These are all first 20 games. 2021, 5, 14, and 1. 21, 22, 4, 15, and 1. 22, 23, 7, 12, and 1. These fans, and and I don't I don't blame them. Like they every year they're off to a start, which you really can't fight back from a lot of times. And this year, we gotta get off to a better start. And sure as shit, with all the madness around the organization, it's happened again. So I don't really blame the fans for like enough. Like we we do we want a new coach. Now, Brady's argument and an argument in terms of keeping DJ Smith is like they do play hard. A lot of times when you see coaches get fired, forget the losses. It's like lack of effort, lack of discipline. Like they're they're starting games poorly. They've started the season poorly. But in all of these losses against Tampa, uh, the other one at home, they they are they're like mounting comebacks at the end. And Brady mentioned, like, we're not giving up. So for the fans to look at that and say, yeah, you're not giving up, but you're losing and you're starting poorly again. And we have this roster that is capable of winning games and every single year we suck and then we're fighting to get back in the mix. So I understand the fans, but for Pierre Dorian, I'll say this. If Ottawa goes on to win the Stanley Cup someday, he has a lot of Dale Talon on the Chicago Blackhawks because you look at what he's created. He's got Sanderson locked up long-term. He's got Shabbat long d- locked up. He's got Stutzel. He's got Kachuk. He's got Batherson. He's got Norris. He's built a core that I think can get the job done in the NHL. I don't know about winning a Stanley Cup, but he's had guys, young guys, buy in and sign long-term. Has he had some fuck-ups? No doubt. Was he getting fired after this? No doubt. I mean, this is like a new owner comes in, there's a chance you get fired anyways. Well, he got fired from being a GM. He's still allowed to be the secretary and uh, and a few other jobs that he had in the meantime. I just... I just think that in the end, if Ottawa goes on to have success that their fan base believes they can ha- that they can have, Pierre Dorian will have a lot of respect within that fan base years down the line. Um, you you, um, you reminded me of my brain fart there when I when I forgot what I was going to say. Um, they their their record the last few seasons in the month of November is five twenty and two. Uh, Kelly Rudy was talking about it. So they, you talk about those notoriously bad starts. The month of November has not been good to the Ottawa Senators. To to defend DJ Smith and the team though. Um, throughout that course of time, when they have finally had Norris, Batherson, Pinto, and Brady Kachuk all playing in the lineup at the same time, their record is drastically better. So they have had dealt with their their injury adversity and their Pinto parlay adversity. Um, but as far as DJ Smith's concern, like I don't think he should be fired this early. I think that he, they should allow all these guys to get back in the lineup in order to see what they have. So probably wait till the end of the year. I know that there's a lot of pressure in win now and make playoffs now. And uh, Ann Lauer might just want a clean house and want a clean slate in, going into next season and maybe get a new guy in there to see how he can feel around the team. But ultimately, if you go back to that Ottawa-Tampa game, I wasn't crazy with um, Corpus Allo getting pulled after that third goal. 
There was two goals that were scored off deflections. Like, were they the best of goals? No. That third one was after he got when he got yanked, and you saw Corpusalo go to the bench and chuck a stick down the hallway. So, managing the goaltenders, I would say that that wasn't a, a, a good call in the midst of that game. But overall, if Brady Kachuk, who's in the locker room, is wants him as a coach, is it going to bat for him? Some of you are going to say, "Well, what else is he supposed to do?" Well, I I'm pretty sure that they're like they have a great relationship, and as you said, Wit, it seems like the guys don't quit on them and they want to compete for them they're just dealing with some early growing pains from being a young team so i i agree i think it's too early to fire him i think in 10 more games if if they go two and eight in the next 10 i think he's probably gone because they have to get back in this race but in terms of their play when they lost to la i think it was chikrin after who said that team just plays with so much structure. Like, LA's on a roll right now. They have a hell of a team. They're deep. They're heavy. And saying, like, wow, the structure they play with, it's just so hard to get anything done. It's it, it, it's it, it's in a sense saying, like, we don't have that structure right now. And so I don't think it is on DJ Smith. I think you got to give this a little bit more time. You got to get guys healthy. And Pinto won't be back till January or whatever it is. But at some point... The, the anvil will fall on Smith if it doesn't get turned around. So this is the flip side to wanting the, the, the league going younger. Like the skill level is high. Everybody's flying around, toe dragging, the releases. Everything about the game from the skill aspect has gotten better. But you like look at the teams that really, really suck at structure. Toronto, they're brutal. They give up a ton of goals going back to the night against Buffalo, 6-5 game. Buffalo is one of those teams as well. All these younger teams. The oil. The, the oil, all these younger teams that are, ho- are hoping that people they, they take the next step, it all goes back to the fact that they're playing too loose and they don't play well as a five-man connected unit. That's why I'm bullish on the LA Kings, not just because they have these monster in the, monsters in the center of the ice, but because they're older and they understand how to play a 200-foot game, as well as how they're able to draft and develop. Like when you... When you get drafted by the Kings, usually they 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 pick guys who are going to eventually slot into that role. They don't just try to go for all these skill guys and say, hey, hopefully we fucking pull a rabbit out of our ass and all these guys are going to end up lighting the league on fire. It's like, no, they in the later rounds, they draft guys where they're going to say, well, we're going to eventually need a guy to step in as, as a fourth defenseman who's going to help kill penalties, block shots, play physical. He's going to be good in the net front. Not all these guys who are fucking toe dragging pylons during the summertime. They need guys to fill in certain roles. So, I mean, when you when you when you when you have these teams that are average age 25, 26, go watch how they play as a five man connected unit and how long it's a, is it going to take DJ Smith to get through to some of these young guys who have never had to play with that type of structure because they were lighting up the junior ranks and and flourishing in that regard. Well. In the NHL, man, if you're going to fucking play like that, you're going to get bit in the ass by these teams who know how to play as a unit. That's as simple as that, man. Watch any fucking game against the, 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 those two types of teams and watch who gets eaten alive. Yeah, I see a lot of people complain. They, they basically just play a dump and chase game and they, they the system's not right for, for the caliber of talent they have. Is, do you agree with that, basically, Biz? I mean, the, 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 they well, got to but if, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, no, no, it's a great question, right? So you look at the other side in which, uh, for instance, Buffalo is given a lot more leash. They're, they're, they're saying, go go have at it, and then we'll reel it in from there to try to teach them game situation. But if if you have a team with that much young skill, I would not say dumping and chasing is the way to go. You want to have clean zone entries and and lead in that category. That's why you have those types of skill guys. So the dump and chase game... I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a, but there's also a time and a place already. If a team is, is good at back pressuring and they're able to maintain a good gap, well, you're not going to try a, a move at the line. You're going to have to place the puck in a certain area and then go get it. So, the, but the, if the, you look at Stutzel and you look at, uh, say, Norris and Batherson, like if you got a bunch of Brady Kachucks, throw it in there and go get it back. They don't necessarily have a ton of those guys. Like they don't like w- w- their old team. Those teams that were wagons. Like remember Chris Neal and a guy like uh, even Vermette was smaller, but he was a dog. And and Chris Kelly, like a smart, he'd go dump it in and get it. They have skill, so dumping it in. Yeah, if you don't have the person, you need to a get bunch back, of hymens. It, it makes no sense. We can't say anything good about any Oiler. <laughs> this episode. <laughs> uh, 
As for the open position, Steve Steos, he's the president of Hockey Ops. He's not going to take it over. He's going to find the new one. And I think it's going to be like we've been seeing a lot, a GM and a president kind of working together with the GM allegedly having the final say. Uh, also, uh, Elliot Friedman said he, a few exe- executives told him that the punishment was so bad because the NHL felt it was, quote, misled uh, during the investigations. Uh, that's a big no-no was one of the quotes that Elliot got. But he, oh, someone also. Sorry. All right. Yeah. That is a thing we should bring up. Like m- me bringing up that the NHL should maybe be like double checking all this. And, and maybe I'm so off base. But for Chicago. And what went on there, which is now being brought up again with another player suing the team, for them to be fined money, ask Ann Lauer, dude. He'll pay a fine, but don't take away a first-round pick. Chicago didn't lose a first-round pick. And and Jersey lost a first-round pick back in the Kovalchuk saga, and then it was rescinded. So I, I, I don't know if this is over. I don't know if Ottawa has a chance to turn this into a second-round loss, second-round pick loss. But that's, that's where you look at the league and the inconsistencies of saying, how does the Chicago Blackhawks, after that entire ordeal, not lose a first-round pick and the Senators do? To me, that is bullshit. Just, I mean, just favoritism but with an old franchise that the league's been friends with. He is. I mean, is it, is it as simple as that? There's way? no other way to put it. Right. right. It is It is ridiculous. When you consider what they did. And, and yeah, the, the New Jersey pick, that was from the Kovalchuk signing. And they never had to forfeit that pick because new owners took came over. So they didn't want to penalize the new owners. Come so on. why are they penal- Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Lower has every right <laughs> yeah. to be bullshit. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and as far as Pinto, uh, that wasn't actually technically NHL discipline. It was a negotiated settlement. That's why no one knows what happened uh, officially because it's a confidentiality agreement. So nobody knows what's going to happen. I'm but sure you never know what's happening in the NHL. They re- what they released two sentences on the draft pick that Ottawa had to give up. Yeah. It's just they, they say whatever they want to do and that's it. And they don't take questions. And there you go. So. Then, you know, you got guys out there doing some digging, trying to figure all this out, when in the end, fans are left wondering, why are there so many inconsistencies in punishments coming down from the commissioner's office? One thing I do know about this Ottawa situation, Brady Kachuk is a hell of a fucking captain and leader for going to bat for his coach in that post-game presser, and he shows it. He shows up night in, night out. I, I think he had two goals in that one against Tampa Bay, so just a dog and uh, a shitty situation for Ottawa and a team that we want to see make playoffs and, uh, and go on a bit of a run here. Yeah, Elliot also said a, a bunch of players reached out to the agents saying, you know, if the not knowing if they might have been violating the same thing Shane was because it was so vague. And basically, it's, you know, don't even, if your friends joke with you, don't, excuse me, I, excuse me, I gotta fly me. Oh my God, keep this on the YouTube. <laughs> what's going on over there, Ari? I can't see what's happening. No, I had, I had a frog, I had a cough. I don't want to have groceries out when I, why, whatever, come no out. No problem, no problem, buddy. Of. Hope you're all right. <laughs> did you just you're, spit, uh, did you just spit a loogie on the floor? No, 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 no. I, gra- oh, I grabbed okay. the, uh, adapted so so yeah basically all these players that you know they don't know if they're breaking these rules or whatever so basically they're just you know telling them don't place bets with third parties don't joke around with every anyone so and these kids are young man and, they, and all you see is gambling everywhere nowadays so I think it's it's easy for these kids to probably fall in and make a mistake like that but that's why I think they're I don't know, hanging fucking Pinto's nose to the wall like this it's way too much but uh Biz how about this one for you uh when Ann Lauer was buying the Senators. He had to sell off the 10% of the Canadians that he owned. He, he bought a 10% of the Canadians way back in 09. You know what he got for 10% of the Canadians? This number fucking blew me away. $130 million? I was going to say $160 million. Not even close. So a value, if we're valuing them at $1.5, $150 billion? Uh, $2.5 billion for the 10% of, of the Canadians. $2.5 so, so, billion, R.A.? So, so, so yeah. he got $250 million. No, two point five billion. There's not that, a like, chicken dick's chance. All right, that, that means that, the team's that, worth well, fucking two hundred billion dollars. Two hundred fifty billion. Wit. No. That's ten. All right. Well, I, <laughs> I suck it. <laughs> all right. No. I'm no. Really, this, no. No, I, listen, I do this, this adds no. humor and comedy yeah, know, to the absolutely. podcast. This is just <laughs> as, as, as wonderful as last week. We were talking about how horrendous the San Jose Sharks were, and then <laughs> you went out of your way to compliment the goaltenders, <laughs> and they have gotten bent over for 10 goals in back-to-back games, buddy. You're the hog. <laughs> hey, so I just I just uh, looked it me. up. It's it's ten percent of a two point five billion dollar so evaluation. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I should. I mean, like that's I said, all right. I should, hey, you're the hog, baby. That. You're the hog. As long as you can. Imagine if the, the Canadians were worth two hundred billion. <laughs> Actually, you know, you know what they were worth uh, when he bought it on them. I, I think I got this one right. 
The Habs were worth $575 million back in 2009. Now they're worth at least over $2 billion. That's a crazy fucking increase. So, Holy shit. Uh, and they, uh, Ian Lau also got the uh, AHL Belleville, Belleville team in the deal. And the uh, Melbourne Estate still has 10% of the Sens as well. So, all right, before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at Sport Clips. Your hair may grow fast, but after going to Sport Clips haircuts, you'll wish it grew even faster. That's because Sport Clips has the best seats in here. And that may or may not be because they happen to be right in front of TVs playing sports all day, every day. We know that watching sports while getting a haircut sure beats watching your reflection getting a haircut, which is why at Sport Clips, every day is clippers and curveballs, high tops and Hail Marys, and even waves and wickets, if you're into that sort of thing. At Sport Clips, you can check in with the pros in men's hair and totally check out the pure, uninterrupted re- relaxation. So yeah, come watch an endless stream of sports on TV while getting an awesome haircut. Sport Clips is the best. Got one right across the street from me, man. They do an unreal job taking it down to the dub for myself. Sport Clips, it's a game changer. All right, sticking with the Ontario teams. The Leafs came to Boston last week. Big matchup. Every time these two teams play, it's usually a high-intensity, entertaining game. Goes down to the Y, and Bruins won 3-2 in a shootout. I thought the goalies, both of them, were incredible. Samson off and swimming that night, but Brad Bashan making noise again. Uh, him and Timothy Lilligren went to the corner. People think Bashan tripped them. Other people think it was incidental. Biz, what's your take on it? And did he deserve a, a penalty or any sort of punishment? So I think people who think Brad Marchand is guilty are trying to label it as like a can opener. Um, there was a, there's a lot to break down about this. The Leafs reaction, the comeback, like you said already, just a crazy game. So for those of you who think it was dirty and Marchand should be suspended based on reputation, uh, watch the clip over. Now, the, if you if you see the the clip that is from his, over his right shoulder from Marchand looking the other way, it doesn't really look that good to make a case for him. But if you watch the angle from their backs, what you'll see is, is Lilgren going into the corner, looks at Marshaw first, and then takes ice to go meet him and make contact over towards Marshaw. So not only did Lilgren make contact, they both know what's going on. They're going into the corner for a battle for the puck. So what do they try to do? They try to tie up sticks. So they meet about halfway in the stick battle. This is where it looks like Brad Marshaw, as the stick battle is won, gets his gets Lilgren's left foot but it doesn't happen at that point. So when the stick battle goes to 50-50, the way that Lilgren ends up positioning himself to go in to make contact, his legs are spread so far apart. So as soon as Lilgren and Marshall are making their way closer to the corner, Lilgren's turning his body where he has to not only get on the inside edge of his right foot, he then brings his left foot over to get to his outside edge so he can make a two-foot stop to secure himself from not hammering into the wall. But as he brings his left foot in, that's where it ends up meeting the blade the blade of Marshawn's stick. And as Marshawn's trying to pull his stick out to then make a play on the puck, it looks as if though he can open them. So you can stop and freeze frame this as much as you want, but that is going into the corner for a straight up puck battle. And like I said, at the point of where Marshawn's stick was when they finished off the stick battle and it got as far over to the left as possible, Lilgren brings his foot to make contact with Marshawn's blade. So if you're looking over the angle of the the shot over Marshawn's right shoulder, yeah, it's not going to look good. But look at the other angle in order to make your decision. So I know that some of you who are Leaf fans or just Marshawn haters in general want him suspended for that. Nah, that's a straight up fucking puck battle. Now, the response from the Leafs, that's a completely different story. Now, Whit, before I go into that, do you agree with my breakdown of the fact that he shouldn't have been suspended? Yeah, I think it could have been a two-minute call, but no suspension on that. And and if he'd gone in and somehow pushed him from behind, 
and he's got the sprained ankle. He's out this long. We're talking a different story. Lingren bumped into him first, trying to get that body contact out of the way, trying to kind of initiate a bump and then being able to protect the puck. And boom, it was a shitty break and probably a penalty. But in, in no way is that a suspension. I don't care who it is. And be, if it wasn't Marshawn who did it, if that's Jake DeBrus, no one's saying a word suspension-wise. Yeah, and so another thing, too, is they brought up a good point on Hockey Night in Canada. I think it was Kelly Rudy. There's been a, a oh, lot of— Oh, you on that this week? I was on hot. I don't know if you guys heard 303,000 on the YouTube channel. And I was on hockey night in Canada this past week. Not a big deal. Um, he, he just brought up the point that it happened quite a bit in the last week. So it was maybe something to look out for. It happened to Ian Cole in Vancouver where he was going back. And that was more on an icing, much like the Kale McCarr one, which people were freaking out about when a Poso ended up pushing his hip. So going into the wall is, it, you know, it's a, these guys are traveling fast. And the minute that you make contact, anything can happen. And this is a big component as to why they ended up taking out that, uh, the, the touch up icing, right? Cause it, when you're going that fast back, it could end up catastrophic. Now, as a Leafs fan and just somebody who wants to touch on, on team culture, I thought the way that they handled Marchand after that went down was pathetic. I know that most of you have seen the clip of at least Reeves saying something to him, but I've played on one championship team in pro hockey, and it was with the Manchester Monarchs. If that would have happened on our team and that reaction would have took place, Mike Stuthers would have had that clip of the bench and Marshawn going by chirping and then a bad look with Bertuzzi kind of chuckling. That to me was obviously the, the probably the worst look of all of it, but he would have walked in the room. He would have had the video guy set up the, the, the laptop to the TV. He would have played the clip. He would have stopped it. He would have looked around. He would have rewinded it. He would have played it one more time. He would have looked around and then he would have put the the laser pointer down and he would have walked out of the room and everybody in the locker room would have had to look around and face themselves as to how pathetic the, it was and, and how they handled that situation. I don't care. And, and you might be listening and saying, well, you're being a hypocrite. You're saying it wasn't a dirty hit. Well, they didn't know that. They didn't know it wasn't a dirty play. And it doesn't and matter. It doesn't fucking matter. Exactly. But it doesn't matter. You stick up for your teammate and it's Brad Marchand and you're in a competitive game in the Atlantic fighting for fucking points. And especially for some of these guys trying to establish themselves on a new team, especially Bertuzzi. It, 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 that, that play, if, you would have, if it would have been Manchester, there would have been four or five depth guys that would have been standing up, and as Brad Marchand skated by the bench, they would have followed him all the way to the end, and they would have been yelling at him, letting him know that they were going to take his fucking head off the rest of the game. And that's what was weird, Biz. It's like Tavares, Jan Croak, like, yeah, Reeves is yelling, but like, how are they not like five guys standing up, fucking all giving it to him? It's just like they're looking at him. The, the and for Tuesday la laughing, yeah. I will say I think it's he was more laughing like you fucking asshole. Yes, like a disgusted laugh, but eh. it's still it's the visual, dude. So the, the also a clip surfaced of he was asked before the game after morning skate. Um, it was it was a, a reporter goes, why don't you just play it? Learn about Marchand being a teammate with him that you did not know beforehand. Um, that he's a good guy. <laughs> uh, what makes him a good guy? Uh, he's just easy to, to get along with. Um, you know, he's funny. Um, and uh, yeah, he's just he's a lot of fun to be around. Do you think you have kind of the insider information on him now that will be easier to kind of deal with him if he tries to get you off your game? Yeah, I know. He's just full of now. Um, but he's probably going to trying to do something tonight but so probably not a good timeline of him saying and, and playing tummy sticks pregame with brad marchand but i understand that bertuzzi's in a tough spot i honestly feel that he left his heart in boston much like i feel like huberto left his heart in florida right because bertuzzi i know he only played there for a little bit but he went over to a team that he assumed was going to end up going on a run and winning a stanley cup with and it seemed like him and brad marchand really hit it off and for whatever reason which i'm assuming it was a cap situation they couldn't pay bertuzzi and bring him back the way that that he wanted to be compensated and they just couldn't work it out so he finds the next best thing, which is Toronto. He gets to go there on a one-year deal, making 5.5 to prove himself. And then with the cap going up next year, he can go sign wherever the fuck he wants and, and make the money that he thinks he deserves. So I guess my advice would be, it sucks that that had happened. 
it, 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 it looks horrible. The coach called it out. The GM called it out after the game. But from here on out, like you have to understand how passionate Leafs fans are. And now that you're signing this team, you have to bleed blue. So regardless of your relationship with Brad Marchand, when something like that happens or moving forward when they play against each other, when a, when he goes into a collision and hurts your teammate, you can't be sitting down on the bench chuckling at whatever he's saying back to Revo, regardless of what he's chuckling about with. It just looks yeah. horrible and it looks like he's not engaged emotionally. And this isn't just in the game against Boston. This is other than a few bright spots and maybe a few good games, like he has not looked like he did in Boston. He doesn't look no. like that same player. And in fact, all of the signings that the Leaf have had and the guys that they brought in between Domi, Klingberg, Reeves, Bertuzzi, they don't have a five on five goal yet in what, 11 games now? So this was a big wake up call, in my opinion, for the Leafs. But then they bring that effort against the Buffalo Sabres, which disgusted me even further. Oh, oh, let's not stop there, Biz, because they're down four to one with five minutes left in the first period right now oh, the Tampa for Bay Lightning. <laughs> Samsonov just got pulled after allowing four on 12 shots. Oh, he didn't really have a chance on Kucherov's second, the third goal. He didn't have a chance on points goal to make it 4-1. He slams his helmet on the bench. It is a disaster in Leafland. Luckily, my team in Edmonton is buzzing right along. So things are good in E-Town, <laughs> and things are shit in Toronto. And I, I will say, Biz... When Bertuzzi went over there, there was a crazy amount of playoff success. Granted, it was seven games. And I think he's looking at it like, I'm a Canadian kid. I'm going back to play in Toronto. And the idea of playing for the Toronto Maple yep. Leafs is an amazing idea. It's an amazing thought. Being on a successful Leaf team, I can't imagine much better in the league. Just knowing what it means to that city, knowing the popularity. But when you go there and you struggle... Then you see the other side. Oh, yeah. And you see the side from players' point of views where they're like, I, I, I don't never want to play there. <laughs> and right now, he's going through it. And the entire team's going through it. And the only thing I'll say that's a big-time worry, championship teams have often had to be called out by their coach or their GM for play, right? Like the Chicago Blackhawks, you remember the losing streaks they went on. I think in two of their three cups, they might have had like eight, nine game losing streaks at one point during the year. And they're not playing the right way and they're turning pucks over and the discipline's not there. I don't ever remember a championship team getting called out for something like this. No. Because there's never issues. There's, there's issues in terms of the PK or the power play or effort, but backing each other up and being a family dude that that is never something that championship teams have to be questioned about Wait, and what go, happened what happened you go last back, year hold on you go back to vegas and what they fucking did to that guy who <laughs> ran over mark stone in an exhibition game <laughs> Bingo. And, and it's like it's like it's just the whole culture there it's just it's a couple of superstars that get their points and yeah matthews and marner and nylander they're unreal players and tavares is a point per game guy but like Where's the juice? Where's where's the fire? And this is for a lot of teams around the league. And then you see Vegas and you see a team like L.A. And you just see these teams that stick together and you fuck with one, you fuck with all. And that being a point of contention early on is a, a disaster of a sign, dude. It really is. Agreed. And I was just going to point out, what, remember when uh, I forget who it was who bumped into Vasilevsky? There was 10, before Vasilevsky hit the ice in Tampa. Kucherov was flying in there. There was 10 gloves in the air and fists were being thrown. It's a it's a non-negotiable. And this is the issue that they addressed in the offseason. This is why they brought in Reeves. This is why they brought in Domi. And this is why they brought in Bertuzzi for some sandpaper. So I, I tweeted this out. Bertuzzi's the type of guy, it might take him about 20 games to get going because sometimes, you know, these guys they, they back their way in. Did he have the luxury to do that? No. You brought up an incredible point in the fact that some of these guys, they, they oh, I'm going to go play in Toronto. They love the idea of it. Yeah, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, until you have a 10-game cold skid and all of a sudden you're in the witness protection program for crying out loud. And this, the last time, I was talking to Cor Carlo Koliakovo last week. I was asking him about the state of Leafs, like how this, this wall kid and other other dynamics to the group he goes biz like he goes i'm not a leafs hater he goes but this fan base the last time they had success was with the gilmores the you know the the, the wendell clark wendell clark they're dude. used the last time they had success they at least went down swinging and i think that at least if they get that 
they can sleep at night. So a complete wake up call, which I thought after the Saber game, and then now you're telling me the Tampa game is going horrendous too. The 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 positive news is though is I believe the last three, four seasons, they have been 500 after about 10 to 12 games. And then after that, they ended up going on a big time winning streak and we all know they're going to make playoffs. So listen, not time to hit the panic button just yet, uh, but not, not a good sign as far as that championship pedigree in which I mentioned that Tampa has, Vegas has, and we had with the Manchester Monarchs, thanks to Mike Stuthers in the group. <laughs> well, it wasn't all bad for them, Biz. Uh, Austin Matthews had his third hat trick of his, the season already, and sadly he's uh, lost lost to Buffalo. This one attracted a sizable Brazier. Did you see the giant bra that got thrown uh, on the it's, ice? It's, it's like that a drink girl concert. Has cannons. If cannons. that was real, she's got absolute bazookas. More like, <laughs> more like a, AM thirty four double D biz. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I love, how, how long did you have that in the fucking holster? Uh, I had it fucking tuned up there. But yeah, it t- uh, tenth hat trick of his career. Fourth all. He's now he's fourth all time for Leafs. Man, he's still got a long way to go. Uh, also, the Leafs and Sabers they were one of three double digit games Saturday, uh, and it contributed to a new record. One hundred and fourteen goals were scored on Saturday, the most ever in one day. Previous record was one hundred and four. Blew it out of the water. That comes out to seven point six goals per game. Uh, there were two three goal comebacks, four hat tricks. And here's one fight, Biz. 52 penalty shots all last season. There were 13 in October alone. They got 15 now already. So we've been seeing tons of We used to never see these things 20 How many years of ago. the 15 resulted in goals already, you know? Uh, I, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't tally it. Honestly, I should have. One of I my longstanding. 2.5 uh, billion. One of my, <laughs> <laughs> one of my longstanding complaints. If you're given a penalty shot, you should have the chance to take the power play instead. Oh, okay. I would rather a power play than a penalty shot unless it's your best player or, you know, an unreal uh, breakaway guy. I think you should be given the option. Yeah, that's actually an interesting call. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't believe that. 52 already, man. I mean, you you should maybe one a month back, probably 20 years ago, went, you know? I, they were very 52 uncommon. already? Didn't you just say there were 15? No, 52 last, all, all, last season. There were 50, 52 last season. There were 32. So I'm fucking reading. So 52 last season, 13 in October, and this 15 through the season already. So it's at a crazy okay. rate. We got Batman versus Al Lauer. We got DJ Smith and Brady Kachuk against the fans. And then we got RA against yeah. numbers. This the, podcast. The fucking- <laughs> this, Seriously, dude. You know fucking- what? <laughs> I, th- I think Biz probably time to send it over to Derek Stepan. I'm not even sure if we told the folks he was going to be on, but yeah, we had right Derek now. Stepan and um, a little, it's a quick interview. He didn't tell us that he had a tea time about seven minutes after the interview. So we're going to get him on again. He's actually, as we mentioned in the show, going to be a little bit of a contributor. So Derek Stepan, an amazing career. Congrats to him. A long run in the league. Check it out right now. This interview is brought to you by Chevy. Chevy is working to make charging simple. With over 110,000 charging stations across U.S. and Canada and growing, your smartphone becomes your co-pilot when using the My Chevrolet mobile app with Energy Assist. We're trying to get Grinelli to get into the Chevy EV mode. He needs a car. He needs a truck. I say no better option than Chevy. I actually saw one driving on uh, 93 South the other day. Looks so sharp. Thing also moves at a nice pace. Just a beautiful vehicle. I heard it's an incredibly smooth drive to win. I think that's super important. I'm driving Boston to New York a lot. That three and a half, four hour drive. You need something smooth. Nothing smoother than a Chevy EV. Oh, and like I said, the app, you can just control everything from there. It allows you to access vehicle information like battery status and charging settings from anywhere. The energy assist features intelligently plans your routes, tells you where and how long to charge up, and gives you real-time data and charging station availability. That's what's nice, right? You find out there's a charging station, but this actually tells you if they're all full and you got to find another one. So that app is a game changer. There are three different home charging levels available. Chevy electric vehicles offer great options for charging. All of them as simple as just plugging in your smartphone. So learn more at chevy.com slash electric. That's chevy.com slash electric. Get involved. Well, it's a pleasure to bring on our next guest, this gutsy and reliable center just retired after a 13-year NHL career with the Rangers, Coyotes, Senators, and Hurricanes. He played 1,010 regular season and playoff games, including the Stanley Cup final appearance in 2014. He also made the playoffs in 10 of his 13 seasons and never spent a day in the minors. 
Thanks a bunch for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Derek Stepan. Congrats on the retirement, brother. How you doing? He loved it when he smiled when you said didn't spend a day in the minors. Hey, eh? look at him smiling. <laughs> he never got to experience that. Being a silver spooner more than I did. <laughs> I love that. You look like Ra's son. Yeah. Well, are you guys related? Do you have something to tell him, Ra? No, Ra played in the minors. <laughs> oh, he did. <does. laughs> That's awesome. Well, hey, congrats on a great career, man. I mean, I'm sure it's been uh, a difficult decision, but uh, I mean, how do you feel? Where do you lie? And I'm sure grateful for for some awesome time spent in the National Hockey League. Yeah, obviously, uh, it was a it was a hell of a run, and I enjoyed every second of it. And uh, you know, it was it was um, you know, as the summer went on, you kind of I kind of sensed that it was coming to an end. Um, and uh, I have no issues with it. I'm looking forward to the next step, um, which currently is a tea time. So if you guys could wrap it up quickly. <laughs> it's winter is coming here in Minnesota. But no, it's, it's, uh, I'm in a good place. I, like I said, I had a, a, a great run, a ton of fun, and um, uh, met some great people along the way. And I'm grateful for a lot of people that helped me get to here. And, and um, you know, I, I, I appreciate you guys giving me the platform to say thanks to all those people. That's awesome. Well, congrats. And and we got to let people know. So we got hit with the tea time because you don't have much, much time, or I guess you do have a little bit of free time. So you have 30 minutes. We have to talk, obviously, Rangers. Uh, we kind of mentioned the retirement, but also your kind of mind is wanting to co- become a GM. But I guess I'll hand it over to, to you already to ask about the Rangers stuff. All right, yeah, kick right into the Rangers. Uh, Derek, you were the first, what, 70 years of your career. When you first got there, it was a very young team. Like, how did Tortorella run the locker room? Was there, was there like a designated sheriff? How did that play out with so many young guys on the team? Well, Torts ran the locker room. He was, <laughs> he was on top of it. And um, they they made the switch to kind of go younger. And um, and we were kind of the first group to be under the Torts realm. And he was, he was on us. I mean, training camp was crazy. We had like crazy skate tests. I mean, he's, he, they still do a lot of stuff, but we had some crazy tests when I first started. Um, and that's kind of where we started. And we kind of had this mucky group that kind of just bought into it and, and went along with it as, uh, you know, as, as he demanded it. And, and that's what made us successful. And then obviously we had the superstar in the net with Hank, which, you know, anytime that he was in that, you got a chance to win. So those kind of, the, that was kind of the formula and torts was, you know, Torts was kind of heading the whole thing. So when you left school, you lit it up sophomore year. It was quite obvious it was time to go pro. But did you kind of expect to make the team? And when you went in there, were, were you like, I don't know how this is going to play out? Like, how did camp go in terms of making the NHL roster right out of school? So when I finished my season in Wisconsin, they called me and said, you're going to probably go back for your junior year. Oh, they said right? that. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, okay, sounds good. And then I think they had like a meeting and Torts was like, I want younger guys. So then I got a call like <laughs> in June, <laughs> like saying, actually, you know what? We want you to sign. So um, I didn't know what to expect. I was actually kind of hesitant to sign because I was like, well, you just told me you wanted me back. Now, like, I, I don't really, want to be in the minors. Yeah, I don't want to be. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, once I signed, I kind of just went into camp thinking if I'm in Hartford to start, that's the case. It's, it is what it is. Um, and it kind of just went from there. And. Uh, I had a great Traverse City and then it led into preseason and torts loved me right from the start. So I just I got to play every in every situation and and it kind of just kept building. And then obviously night one, I scored a hat trick and <laughs> that's um, a good start. Uh, Make them look good. eh? And torts brought me into his office. He's like, well, you bought yourself 20 games. <laughs> <laughs> did you get your apartment letter then or did you already have it? No, he the funny thing about the apartment letter, he called me like it was like after christmas and he like brings we're doing like the you know indy 500 before practice where guys get he out there loves that one 50 minutes and everyone's just skating laps and he comes up to me after and he's like hey uh you got your apartment right and i was like no no one said anything to me he goes oh that's my bad step i was supposed to tell you like a month and a half ago <laughs> oh hey do you think he actually did it to save you some money from uh, new york city rent or did he never say I, that i was good because i was i was living in like a extended stay with like Ruslan Fedotenko. So he was taking care of me. So it actually kind of worked out in a, in a weird way. I, I, you mentioned like Torts loved you. It makes sense. Playing against you, talking to teammates of yours, like just a super smart player, yeah. high hockey IQ. So did it crack you up at times? Like if Torts did like you and and it was pretty good to you, but he'd just be torturing Gabrick. You're like, Jesus Christ. Like this guy's scoring 40 and getting ripped on constantly. Yeah, he... I mean, I think the 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 thing was is like when I came in, he was like I was 
whatever Torch said, I was going to do, and he knew it. So you yeah. never had to like drive it in. Where Gabby hit, was an older guy, and he was like, kind of like I've seen a bunch of coaches like we're not we're not doing this right now. Where I was kind of <laughs> like, yeah, whatever you say. Like I was just out there, like I had brown on my nose. Like whatever you say, Torch. Like I'm just going to go do it. <laughs> Uh, before that first game, didn't they say they, they were only planning on giving you one game and maybe sending you back? Is that yeah, so there, there was always talk of that. And then, you know, I, I mean, I thought for sure it was going to be Hartford. And then I think uh, Torts kind of, you know, he just – he he brought me in. He's like, hey, I need 20 games. I played, like, 20 games with, like, Bugard and Pruss on the fourth line. We weren't playing a whole lot. And then game 23 or 24 – he brought me in. He's like, get ready to go. You're going to play. And I played with Froloff and Gabrick the rest of the year. Wow. So, was, so how'd you get that Hattie first game on the fourth line? No disrespect to the fourth line. but <laughs> I, I wasn't on that line. Oh. Um, Eric Christensen, I think, was hurt game one. So I played with Fedotenko and Sean Avery, which Sean Avery is like <laughs> part of three or four first game hat tricks. I don't know if you guys knew that. Is he? No way. Yeah, that, he, that might be a crazier stat than the Halsey one assisting on uh, on four first yeah. overall pick goals. He's yeah. a, he's assisted on how many? Or he's been a part of like three. I, I remember seeing something. It was like three out of four. Like so, the what was the kid's name in Dallas? Oh, um, um, the Fabian Brunstrom. Yep. And then there, and then there was like he was like something crazy, some crazy stat like that. So you have to look it up. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I remember seeing that. But yeah, so it was Eric Christensen was a little banged up, and I think he was out. So I played up with that that group that first game. What was it like being thrown into that whirlwind of like the NHL and like being, you know, Hank's your goalie. You have Sean Avery on your team. You know, you're you're probably in the tabloids if you're going out to dinner with these guys. Like, what was it like? And were you single back then? No, I was dating Stephanie. Okay. Uh, but no, it was it was I don't I, it was such a blur. Like I was just like just in this autopilot. Like I had a good Traverse City, so I was like, well, maybe you know, you start thinking, well, maybe I could stick around. And then you have a good preseason game. It's like now that now that you know the media is talking about, well, maybe Stepan should stick around. And then it starts to build. So you're just like so focused in. And then once the dust kind of settled, and you're like, I mean, I was 20, so I wasn't really like allowed to be out drinking <laughs> so it was, it was i was just young and i lived in the suburbs you know i lived in white plains for the first like until christmas basically the past christmas so it was a lot harder to get into the city sometimes after games i'd stay in staying with del Zotto, but for the most part i'd go back out was he pitching apartment sales to you when you were hanging out with him the big real estate mogul I don't think Del Zotto was doing real estate then, was he? No, he wasn't. No, he was not. He is now. So if you need a condo, I was doing construction work with the pile driver. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, hey, we we couldn't bring it up on the interview. I don't even know if we're going to be have dropped it yet by the time we drop yours. But uh, we didn't bring up that whole Lisa Ann thing. Did that happen when he was playing with the Rangers? It was. It wasn't when. It wasn't when I was there. So he. But he was there with us for three, two oh, years, yeah. or two years, and then he got traded to Nashville for Kevin Klein. Yeah. So I don't know. That was after. So I, I can't, can't comment on. I it. always like to ask guys who played in New York, especially when you guys are going through these runs. Like, did you get uh, any fun celebrity interactions? Like, who did you end up bonding with in the city? Who, who maybe is a, you know a known name? Um, I, I didn't. I mean, I got to meet some people, but I didn't really like bond with a whole lot of people. Um uh geez i I, yeah it was kind of i mean obviously the mark from oar you guys i don't know oh uh, he's a great guy i i I met him at a little show he did i went with uh keith yandel a bunch of guys and then he was at hazy's wedding he's awesome oh unreal dude unreal dude and like tanner glass lived in the same apartment complex as them and one night like uh tanner's wife was like hey you want to come to to his wife like you want to come to the game and it was like they didn't even know that it was it was market. No top. shit. <laughs> yeah. And then they just started to build from there. <laughs> Step, you played by Ryan McDonough two years in college, then seven, first seven years in the pro. Are you still uh, in touch with him on a frequent basis? Not as much as uh, we'd like uh, with family and stuff like that. He was the best man in my wedding. We were like, when we were at school, we, you know, we played video. We were kind of nerds, but we played <laughs> video games all the time. And then our first few years in New York, we always lived like literally one floor from each other so we spent a lot of time together we were boys and uh as we grew up and got families we got busy and and we've lost a little bit of touch and he well he plays till june every year too so it's hard to (laughs) connect with him when he's going for a cup every year so were you were you uh like top five drunkest guys at his cup parties i didn't go to either no shit yeah i I had you were golfing (laughs) 
Yeah, yep, exactly. There's more important things in life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, I didn't win it. Good, good job, Mac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was he just a machine in college too, though? Yeah. That like guy. scary numbers in the gym. Really? Yeah, because, you know, like college, you. Yeah, you all do you're like, doing is working out. Yeah, you're lifting like, like we're talking like Olympic lifts. Like hit, at Wisconsin, we had these plaques and Mac was a freak. I don't mean to chirp you, step, but I think who did I reach out to? I think it was uh, uh, we had him on Girardi, and he said at your end of the year meeting with Vigneault one year, and you broke your jaw, mind you, and played through it. He said that you had a, a body like a professional bowler. <laughs> now we were yeah. talking about McDonough being a, a maniac in the gym. You were a guy who who didn't train in the off season, right? Or not much. I would do like I would do like the bare minimum. So basically, it'd be like Monday. <laughs> was optional because you Monday. Tuesday, I was in the gym every Tuesday. Like, Tuesday was a lock. Wednesday might have been a golf day. Thursday is starting to go to the cabin. And Friday, you're at the cabin. So. Okay. <laughs> hey, 13 years, dude. Which, hey. which is incredible that you lasted 13 years. But, like, do you think that that maybe played into it down the road as, like, not being able to keep up? If my feet moved as fast as my brain Moved. <laughs> you would have been Gabra. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to do this podcast, but uh, unfortunately, the old feet slowed down. The boots got a little heavy. It, I'm not blaming it on the training. I'm blaming it on genetics. Yeah, there you go. That's what I say too. I'm shaped like a pear because of my grandfather. But uh, <laughs> those years, like the first year, you had 45 points, then seven straight, like mid 50s. That's pretty impressive. And were you getting first power play time all those years? Um, yeah, for the most part, okay. New York, we kind of had, we had, we had a stretch where we had two units where it just kind of, but yeah, for the most part, I was getting solid power play time. There's actually some discussion. I'd like your opinion, considering everyone we talked to says they could see you as a GM in the front office someday. Yeah. Edmonton's power play last year broke all these records and they're, 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 they've already started off pretty decent. But when you say you had two units, some people say that they should try to have a second unit and it's like the first unit a minute 50 like do you agree in two units more if it's that good just let them play the whole two i don't know our the big reason why is our power play struggle a little bit so it's more like okay. hey let's spread them out and just see if we yeah. can get something to work and it kind of started to work a little bit um i think if you got big boys i think you let the big boys run mm -hmm. uh which just mentioned being a general manager would you run into billy garen how just you guys are neighbors that went off for breakfast and uh got in with them i guess to now you're yeah. what do you call it shadowing them around yeah, yeah, it's I'm a kind of a floater this year with them. Uh, just kind of gonna follow them around. I'll do some trips down to Iowa so I get the you know get get that silver spoon a little rusty. Uh, <laughs> Wait till you see the subs after the games. Yeah, I'll get this. I'll start to get to get my foot in the door a little bit. And yeah, he's my neighbor. He walked by and said, "Hey, I'm interested. You got any spots for me?" And he was you know generous enough to give me an opportunity. I'm I'm really excited about it. It's gonna be a lot of fun. I've kind of already you know, poked my head in here and there. And it's cool to see the other side of it. It's been a lot of fun for me so far. But Step, if you if you talk to anybody who played with you, they would have said that they could envision you end up getting in a role like that down the road. Uh, down the road. You love to talk shop. You always like to talk shop. I know I chirped you about the gym, but you're always thinking the game and thinking ahead. Like, like what is it? what is it that you love so much about the game and why you want to do this after retiring? Well, maybe it's because my feet have slowed down so much. You know, it's it's something that, you know, I, I always told guys when I play with them, I, I truly believe that I'll probably be better post-career than my, my my career that I had. Come on over. Come say hi. <laughs> All right, yeah. Me too. I'll warm up in a second. He's talking to Eric Stahl, folks. They got a big money oh, match. Shit. They got a big Stalzy? money match Stalzy? coming up here. Yeah, so he's made over a hundred million. That's a big dog right there. <laughs> we figured it out that the three Stall brothers have made over a quarter of a billion dollars. Oh, oh fuck! They own God. Thunder Bay now. <laughs> they could buy the whole city and the Cactus Club there. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. So yeah, I I don't know what I, the the GM thing is. Just I always thought that it'd be something that I'd be good at. I I think uh, I can communicate with a lot of people. I tried to make an effort. If a opposing GM walked by, I tried to make an effort to shake his hand and introduce myself and maybe ask him a quick question like, Hey, what do you think about this? And just kind of even, you know, the last few years in Carolina, I'd always, when Don would walk by, I'd always just be like, Hey, what do you think about this? And I was on the PTO the You're one like, year. Why are you so fucking cheap? Yeah. I was on a, a PTO with one year and, uh, 
I, Nate McKinnon just signed his big deal, and I, he came walking by the locker room and said, "Hey, Don, now that Nate's done, you want to tie me up?" Because <laughs> he had he, his all his salary was all uh, like league minimum, and it's all in signing bonuses. <laughs> but I knew I was going to get league minimum, so but he. It, so I always try to you know talk to those guys and, and not, not be worried about communicating with them because they're good dudes, and I knew that getting in my foot in the door early is going to be better than waiting and then being like, Hey, I need a job. Well, well the, the big deal you signed with the Rangers, I, I, I was reading, it was basically the 11th hour, right? But right before arbitration, was it one of those things? Like, I, I don't want to go in there and hear how shitty I am. Yeah. So I missed all the training camp after my entry level to get my bridge deal. And so then I finished my two year deal and we're going to get my six my big deal. And we had to go up to arbitration. And I was like, <laughs> Talked to my agent and there was no conversations. I was like, oh God, here we go. And they, they, they got these packets that are like, our side's got like 175 pages and their side's got 250 pages of why the number should be where it is. And we were just about to sit down in the room and uh, my agent and uh, Gortz were like, let's go chat quit. And they got it done on like a yellow note paper. No it way. Like, it. And so it was done. They, the night before they got to the number and then it was just no trades and uh, signing bonuses, but the no trade didn't even work because I got traded and then I lost them. What was the, what was the deal? Six times six, six times six point five. Ooh, that's yeah. a nice one, Steph. That's Fuck, a that's a. What'd you do to celebrate? What'd you buy yourself? New Nothing cabin. Really. Actually, you know what? I, you know what I did do? New quarter I zip. Traded, when I got traded from uh, New York to Arizona, I made it like an additional like <laughs> on just taxes. So oh, then yeah. I, I yeah. threw a big cash just on that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when the trade happened, Derek, were you, were you pissed off? Were you bummed out? Like were you looking for a new opportunity in a different place? What, were you, what was your reaction when you got traded? I uh, just the rumor mail was all there, so obviously I was disappointed. New York was our home for seven years, and um, I didn't know what to expect. It's such a weird thing. You get traded, you're emotional, you don't know what to think, and then you, the GM calls and you're excited. The new GM calls and you're excited to start something new. Um, it was a little bit of a culture shock after going seven years in the playoffs, and then. That first year in Arizona, we didn't win our first regulation game until oh, like. Oh my god! Game. Oh, that was when you that started. That was my first right? year. I think it was eighteen games you guys win, wasn't it? Or maybe at least something like that. We we won some like, games in shootouts and overtime, but our first regulation win wasn't until like game eighteen. Or something. <laughs> No, I think it might have been eleven games. You guys hadn't won one, and, and it was in Philly, and you guys were up two nothing. Yeah. And it's like, okay, finally, we're going to get this done. And they pulled the goalie twice and scored with with the the net empty. <laughs> And it went to OT, buddy. I was I, I had to be on the broadcast with Heater, and he threw it over to me. And I'm like, I, I'm like, I just started, right? I didn't know how to kill time like that. I couldn't be critical, and I'm like, well, I don't even know what the fuck to say, Heater. And then you guys, uh, was it? Did you assist on it to Goligoski in overtime? I did. Oh, you I went did. okay. Well, I was, I, that was a, I was Dashville, USA that year. It was like the first 20 <laughs> games I was on the ice for like oh. 19 goals again. So I was like minus 20 to start the season. Yeah. It, it was, but we got it figured out down there. We had a new coach and a bunch of new veterans and we kind of pieced it together and got it going. And, um, I had a really good time in my three years in Arizona. That's for sure. What was your favorite moment as a Ranger? Like you had, so, I mean, the hat trick obviously to open up, but Ari, you had a list of like some of the, like the game seven goal. Yeah. He, he I mean, he wiped out two teams on his own overtime game winner in game seven versus the caps in 2015 oh. had the empty netter in game six to uh, eliminate Montreal in 2017. And then wow, with Carolina last year, that unreal keep you had at the blue line set the down to Did you always have a knack for the big moment? When oh, you were yeah. a younger kid. I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's such a fun time to play. Like I think the, a lot of the guys nowadays, they get so worked up about like, Oh, it's this game. I was just having fun. Like it didn't, <laughs> it didn't feel like the extra pressure. So I don't know if it was, and maybe I was nervous, but it was more like, Hey, what's the worst that happens if you make a mistake and it ends up life moves on. But, I didn't have that early on. And I think later on, as I kind of started getting more and more, I mean, I had a lot of those moments to start my career with, you know, playing seven straight years in the playoffs in New York. So I think opportunity to help you relax the nerves. And then it's easier to perform when you're not stressed out. Like growing up, were you, were you really good your whole life? Were you a late bloomer? Like how did it go in terms of like your youth hockey experience? Yeah, I'm going to surprise you here. I was slow when I was young. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, he's getting older. He's slow now. I've always been slow. So let's not, let's, let's, let's just put it down into that one. I mean, but, um, but yeah, no, I I just always, my brain always just was able to keep me afloat and keep me above 
uh, a lot of a lot of the the you know steps I took um, when I was at Shattuck. Same thing, you know. I was hockey IQ was the one that kind of carried me all the way through. Never got asked to play at the national program or anything. I did, but oh, I was at wow. Shattuck, and you stayed. I, was at I, I stayed at Shattuck. Oh, that's I was, cool. I, after my junior year, they asked, and I was like, I'm going to stay here. I like it here at Shattuck. Um, my team, we just won a national championship. I'd like to try to win another one. Not uh, that common for a Minnesota kid to go to, to go to Wisconsin. I mean, like, was, that, was that hard for you or was it more just that program was headed in a different direction at the time? Minnesota just didn't have any spots. I mean, really? they didn't have any scholarships and they were kind of full. It, this was like when a lot of kids were committing really young. So, yeah. I mean, they still do. But the, Minnesota was full and it was just kind of one of those things where Wisconsin's like, we're interested. And I went down and visited and I was like, Yep, this is where I'll go. Yeah. Uh, Grinelli reminded me of your 2010 World Junior performance. Would you have 14 yeah. points in that tournament? Yeah, it was a fun tournament. That was in Canada, too, which that, uh, that's that's a nice was one. Was that the John Carlson OT winner against Canada? Oh, that was sick. Yeah, it was a good tournament. We had a good group of guys, and it was a ton of fun. Who were the other NHLers from Team USA on that team? Um, Zucker. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I just got a text on the T, boys. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, we're wow. doing we're doing a monthly segment. You're gonna have to give our NHL yeah. NHL commentary what you're seeing around the league. All we right. got a newly retired player that knows the game, so you're coming back. Absolutely, I'm uh, coming back. Just, I'm not missing tea times. So. Oh, step. Uh, who, who's the foursome? Stalzy. Who else? And then two Edina members. So okay. Two, Some civilians. All right. Hey, maybe 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 you and Stalzy in a sandbagger sometime. How about that one? I would love to do it with you guys. All right. I would love. To. All right. Okay. That's Done. a deal. Knock we'll talk. Dead. We'll talk to you next month, November. We're catching up more. Yeah. All right. I like it. Thanks, All right. guys. All right, Steph. Steph. Take care, Steph. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at Body Armor. Spit and Chicklets is brought to you by Body Armor. From sports drinks to sport water, Body Armor keeps us hydrated all day long. Whether we're talking, watching, or even playing sports, Body Armor is our go-to choice. Real hydration, real ingredients, packed with electrolytes, vitamins, and nothing artificial. Body Armor has great taste and flavors like my favorite, strawberry banana. Also got blue raspberry and tons of others. The best athletes in the world hydrate with Body Armor, like Ronald Acuna Jr., Christian McCaffrey, Alex Morgan, and the latest athlete to join the team, Joe Burrow. My favorite, like I said before, strawberry, banana, but I'll drink any of them. These are all good. They all taste great. If you don't have a flavor, give me the water. It's all great. Keeps you hydrated. Good stuff. Doing late night recordings, boom, need to be hydration. After a chicklet's cup, boom, hydration. Body armor. Does the trick for you. It's available in stores nationwide, so head on over to the Body Armor store on Amazon and get yours today. Huge thanks to Dara for jumping on us, man. We hope to get him back again real soon, unfortunately. Like Wood said, before the interview, we had a little bit of tea time coming up, so... We'll have him back soon enough. But uh, speaking of the Rangers, man, they suffered a huge loss. Uh, Adam Fox is on long-term injury reserve. He was injured on a collision with uh, Carolina's Sebastian Ajo. They also lost Philip Hedl for a little bit as well. But uh, the big injury is Fox. Uh, then Truba kind of called out Ajo afterwards. He, he said, basically, I, I have to answer the bell. He didn't want to answer it. But, uh, Biz, I'll go to you on this one. Was, was this hit or collision something that Ajo even needed to answer for? Or it's like Truba just kind of, you know, Given the talk or what? I Listen, think I know I know Rangers fans think I hate their guts, but like I'm being dead serious on this. Aho one is not that type of player, and if you watch the clip, you could see they don't see each other and they run into each other. And if anything, it was Fox's leg was out a little bit. And it was just an unfortunate accident. And and Rangers fans, like, listen, like I never want to see a player injured, especially one of Adam Fox's caliber. Like he's been off to an insane start. Uh, he's one of the few defensemen in the league who can carry the play as a defenseman. He is a treat to watch night in, night out. Their power play is going to be da drastically affected by his absence. And uh, oh, but overall, no, it it was not a dirty hit. And we talk about the culture of Toronto. Mad, mad respect for not only Truba but uh, Lafreniere. Lafreniere. Fuck, I got to fuck up his name. Help Lafreniere, me out here. Yeah, Lafreniere. 
Lafreniere, who's been having a great season, he was emotionally invested. He was going nuts on the bench, barking at Aho. All of them wanted a piece of him. So very unfortunate accident and a very tough loss for the Rangers, who have been not only buzzing, but one of the hottest power plays yeah, in the league. That's a kind of perfect description. That's how I felt about it. More unfortunate than anything. Uh, if it was a different player, maybe you're questioning a little bit more. Aho, honest guy. Works his bag off. It's just a kind of a brutal accident, I feel like. I'm kind of hearing um, like a grade two MCL sprain. So, you know, could have been a lot worse, right? He'll be back in, in a way, maybe, you know, getting healthy. As long as he's able to get back 100%, which he will, maybe in the end, if the Rangers are going on a long cup run, this absence kind of helps them because Fox will be that much more fresh. That's the bright way. That's the good, the good way of looking at it. Um, Bad, you know, bad side, obviously, you just can't replace a guy like him. But I brought up that Braden Schneider before. So he'll get more minutes now. Maybe get some more power play time. Their D is still very deep. So I think the Rangers will be able to get through this, whether it's a month, two month, I don't know. It just sucks we don't get to watch them, like you said, Biz. So um, get healthy soon, Foxy. So some people, uh, so I've I've done my AC, uh, not AC, I've, well, I have done my ACLs. I've done my MCLs multiple times. I've had a grade one, grade two, as much as like a, a bad grade three, which bad grade three, you're usually, usually out about six weeks, six to, to eight weeks. I would say a grade two, if you're taking it with precaution, probably about a month's time. And that happens when the inside of the knee opens up a little bit and just stretches out. So it's a little I mean, loose that, after, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and I think that that's partly as to why I eventually ended up tearing my ACL is because I'd done my left MCL probably three times to as bad as a, a bad grade three, where that's just a ligament where if, you, if it happens, it's going to be a little bit loose. And if you do it again, it's going to stay loose until you eventually have to get surgery on it. But for a grade two MCL, you don't have to get surgery. It's just a healing time of, like I said, roughly, I would say the longest five weeks. The only thing is I never, I was lucky enough, I never had a knee injury. I mean, I had paper mache ankles, so I guess that speaks for itself. But my knees, <laughs> I never had any knee injuries. Um, it's just probably a little tough that I'm guessing he'd have to wear a knee brace when he comes back. Um, maybe take him a little time to get used to that. But like the good thing is he's not the greatest skater in the world. It's all his hockey IQ and his, and his head fakes and his stick fakes. So I think he'll be back. He'll be back to the Adam Fox everyone looks and, and, and has seen play and dominate. And the Rangers are going to be completely fine. They're, they're a hell of a team. Well said, Whit Dog. Uh, we mentioned earlier that we're going back to California. It's been about four and a half years since we were out there, heading back to the Golden State. Those Southern Cal teams have been on fire lately. Here's one for you. Another one, Biz. I love telling the stats to you. The NHL averages 5.7 new playoff teams over the last seven non-COVID seasons. And we're two weeks from Turkey Day, Thanksgiving in the U.S., and there are four teams that are currently find themselves in playoff position that missed the playoffs last year. Uh, Detroit in the East, uh, and in the West, we have Vancouver, St. Louis, and maybe the most surprising name on this list, the Anaheim Ducks. Quack, quack. They've been hot as hell. They come out one and four. Tough start, but they've won six in a row since. This is crazy, too. It was the Ducks. Yes, uh, Sunday's won the Ducks' fifth third-period comeback in just 11 games. That's an absolutely crazy stat. Uh, uh, McTavish has been on a roll. Zegers hasn't been doing much. Whit, what's, what do you think uh, wrong with Zegers? Is just kind of getting used to the new coach. Whit, what's your take on it? I think Slow the start. lack of training camp um, definitely plays a factor into that. I think that... Well, it's actually a good thing if you're a Ducks fan because he's not going to continue like this. Like, he's not going to finish the year with 20 points, I don't think. And so you look at, like, when he picks it up, that that only adds to their offense. I think the new coach, though, is probably um, pretty demanding on how you have to play, which is evident by their record and, and the, their comeback wins, which is also, at the same time, a little worrisome because you can't continue to do that. You can't always be battling from behind. But Zegers, I think he'll get going. I think his coach is probably demanding more puck protection, um, not giving it up as easy, not trying as many things at the offensive blue line. So it's a little bit of a change, right? You didn't have training camp. You dealt with all the drama of trying to get signed. And then now you got a new coach that is demanding a little bit more than prior. So all those things kind of added up together have created a slow start for him. I think he'll figure that out. Um, but I like looking at the bright side of this team. And and, and, uh, and Mason McTavish, dude, oh. this is an old school 
hockey oh, yeah. player. This guy is buzzing up and down the ice, hitting everything that moves. He's got great skill around the net. He's excellent. I mean, right now he's on the he's on pace for what eighty, maybe ninety points. So like with his draft pedigree, you know, he was picked high. This was expected at some point. This is probably a little early for term for Ducks fans to see this dominance from him. But he's just a future captain, right? He, 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 he's done it internationally, World Juniors. He's done it in junior. He's now showing up. He's willing to fight. He's willing to hit. He gets in your face. Even his, his hair and his, his... He just looks old school. And I Fucking think that's the, type of, that's the type of player you see now. And they have so much success. They're, they're the unicorns, as Biz call them. They're disappearing. And he's rough and tough. And he doesn't give a fuck. And he's there to play hard. And he's in your face. And because of a leader like that, and it, with being... It, with him being a young guy, it's even more impressive. So that and the defense. I mean, this Pavel Mitnikov, he has it all. And he's a 10th overall pick in 2022. He could skate. He's got a cannon, tons of poise with the puck. And like to hop right in, I mean, they're probably, that's what's happening right now. They're, 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 if you're talking to Pat Verbeek and you got his honest assessment, he's looking at McTavish maybe doing this next year or the year after. He's looking at Mitnikov maybe two years doing this. And everything's happened a little earlier and you're seeing the success. And like their goaltending hasn't even, even been that incredible. It's the comeback wins. It's not giving up. They haven't even had Kalorn until last game. So it's just, I think credit also goes to Craig, Greg Cronin, who goes in there and from everything we've heard prior is a no nonsense, no bullshit. You're not going to do it. You're not going to play. And this goes around like for every team in the league. It's a tale as old as time. Ice time is all that matters to players. You want to get an effect. You want to get a difference. You want to get guys to buy in. Take away ice time, dude. That's all. That's all that can be done. And whether it's a healthy scratch or whether it's sitting down for the third period, I don't think he has any problem, no matter who it is, sitting your ass on the bench. And when guys see that and they realize, if I'm not doing it the right way, I'm not going to play, that's the only thing that gets through to players. So he is actually demanding excellence. And while their starts haven't been great, they have this this young group that's willing to to not give in and they're coming back and they're they're I don't know if that could continue but as of right now it's a really fun team to watch too I throw on their games last year no chance boom change the channel now I want to see this young D man I want to see McTavish running someone over it's 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 Carlson too like I mentioned at the beginning is a future superstar and, oh, yeah. and possibly a generational type player with that size and speed and the division and his shot it's like they have a lot of things coming up they don't even have that D-man. Um, is it Zellweger? He's not playing. They got other top picks that aren't playing yet. Like This is a team that in five years is probably going to be competing for a Stanley Cup. And the fact it's happening this quick is awesome for a fan base that's dealt with a few years of, of kind of miserable hockey. And this is without Kalorn, too, who is you know, coming in to help with that championship pedigree as well. And it's just been an incredible story and, and a great breakdown by you, Wit. And I guess I'll start with McTavish too, just to play cleanup. You said it, his ability to want to go to the net and take punishment and live in that area as a younger player, you don't see that much. And there aren't there aren't many of these young guys coming in the league who have that ability to play and take that type of punishment around the net. Like, I mean, there's only like a handful of guys now. Like we always talk about Pavelski and and certain guys who can live at the top of the crease and do that. I mean, he had a big one the other night. Uh, it was to extend that six game winning streak. Who did they come back against? Vegas on Sunday. It was Vegas. The and that was their first regulation so, uh, first regulation loss of, of the season. And they gave the Bruins and, their first yeah. loss. Yep. And um, another guy who's been a bit of a journeyman, and you guys know him best from his start in Boston, is Vitrano. And yeah. he's a he's a natural goal scorer, and it seems like he's found a great home there. And he's got nine on the season already. I think he's got a hat trick as well. Uh, he's been sniping. And the Leo Carlson thing, him coming in where they said they were going to play him one game off, one game on, where the, it seems like the last couple, they haven't, they haven't healthy scratched him. He's so good and he's been dominant so early where they're fucking rolling him out. So maybe you won't see that approach that they were considering taking early on just based on that sheer dominance. And um, I talk about that Daryl Belfry uh, sometimes. He's got that Instagram channel where he does a great job of breaking down players' games. Like Leo Carlson is like, he loves playing that middle of the ice and he can navigate it appropriately based on his, uh, even how young his age is and where he's always in that right spot. And I don't think he... Um, I, mean, I don't think he uh, he's like necessarily that fast, 
but he plays at a, a great pace in which he's always seems to be in that right lane, wh- whether he's being an option for his defenseman or even on the defensive side, being there to break up plays. So very impressed with uh, Leo Carlson early on. And you mentioned that young defenseman stepping up and playing the way he has. And and Troy Terry, another guy who just continues to get it done and uh, a hidden gem out there out west. So as far as the Anaheim Ducks are concerned, I don't know how long they can continue to sustain this with – I mean, that lineup they have and how young they are, but just so impressive off the hop to see what they're doing and and buying into their their new coaches' systems. It gives some serious excitement. I I think I played in Anaheim, I should know. Is it the I-5 rivalry? Is that it? Like, LA-Anaheim. Like, those games are, for a long time, those were battles, and they were fun to watch, and, you know, you maybe get some more juice into that this season. And last thing I'll say about Anaheim, it's not that surprising considering look who's on the back end look who's always on good teams Radko Gudis that's another guy that comes in that's running people over that's taking no shit backing up teammates and all of a sudden they've had a great start so as you said I don't know if this will continue but buddy if they keep this up and you're looking at uh what is it like the 90 95 points 96 points get you in the playoffs like they keep piling these things up, then at least in March they're in the hunt if they don't go on a, on a really bad skid. So it's just exciting having a, a team with no expectations start the year this solid. No doubt. Once again, well said, Wit. I got another one for you. Uh, October had 67 comeback wins out of 140 games. So that's just on the 48% of games had a comeback. Tied with uh, the 86-87 season for the most at that point in the season. It's crazy. That's you know, like like Merle's the other night. Who was down three nothing in one of his bets? I was like Merle's thirty years ago. You counted as a loss, but nowadays, man, like, it's crazy. It's this great. That's I think it's when thing. he had Buffalo over Philly and they lost five one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, L.A. Kings team just north of them. They've been r- raging too lately. It's playing much better. Five wins the last six games. Uh, six straight on the road. At least a point in all but two games. I think Cam Talbot is one of the big stories out there. I. Uh, Struggled a little bit early, but 6-2-1 right now, a 9-2-3 save percentage, 2.14 goals against. He's got a shutout. Started eight of the 11 games. Uh, how about Adrian Kempe putting, doing what he usually does? Fiala only has one goal, but he's got 12 points total. Biz, I know you've got a hat on for the Kings lately. What have you been seeing with this squad? Boy, this, is, this, this is no surprise to me. I knew this team was going to be good. We talk I don't about think the it res- is to anyone. Yeah, their responsibility up the middle and then the complementary wingers. I mean, like, buddy, like, Kempe's been a stud for a few years now. I think he had 40 tucks last year. Fiala was, I think he came back last year in playoffs injured. But other than that, he had an incredible year. He was a fucking all-star, right? So they got just incredible players up front. I love their top now nine. I have, I think they have an underrated decor where they're so well coached and they play under structure where they just have these lunch pail guys back there other than Drew Doughty. And the goaltending, I, yeah, I guess I had to say it was a question mark coming in because Talbot maybe didn't have the best of seasons last year. But go back to two years ago when he was playing with Minnesota before they picked up Flower, he was fucking stellar. And he's had a great career and great numbers up until then. So it's good to see that he's got his confidence back. Another thing about like playing for a team like LA, because they're so structured for a goalie, you know where these shots are coming from. It's very predictable for a goalie to get used to that and get in rhythm and in sync with that team. I mean, Copley came in last year and fucking did it. So this is, like I said, no surprise. The one guy that I I will talk about, though, is Quinton Byfield. He has been a force so far this year. He's been a four-checking machine. And you're talking about a guy who came out of junior as a centerman. So for him to get acclimated to that winger position, you know, has taken maybe a little bit of time. But so far this year, man, he's fit in like a glove. Uh, he, he's a four-checking four machine, and he's picked up the offense. So they are all systems go right now. They are still my fucking, they are still my horse in the West, and I couldn't be happier the way that they're making me look like a fucking genius. I look like a fucking genius picking this team with. No, you don't. I mean, everyone knew they were good. You said they oh, were good. You, you, what do you mean? You had the fucking Oilers ahead of them, you fucking moron. So did You had the fucking Oilers so ahead of them. So did 99% of... So then everybody else, I'm a you fucking you genius didn't have then. You ahead of the Oilers. I'm a fucking genius You didn't have them ahead that. of the Oilers. You're the opposite you, of a genius. You're a fucking moron. What are you talking about? When get did you mor- pick them ahead to finish ahead of the Oilers? Show me that. Show me that. Show me go that get clip. The f- 
Go get the fucking text to, to uh, Merles when we did our, our divisional breakdowns. He said, who do you have in what order? I'm a fucking genius. <laughs> what? Are you, are I'm, I'm looking up? this up. I do not oh, okay, think buddy. you had no, it. No, you're you flustered. You're, you're still flustered. Genius, Just like your but... fucking Oilers and Woodcroft, you're flustered. <laughs> yeah, you did. You have don't want to admit that I'm a fucking hockey genius. Okay, let's see here. You had the Kings winning Give me the a division. double wrister you had the right Oilers now. Oilers ahead of the Knights. So what a fucking genius, dude. You had fucking Edmonton ahead of the Stanley Cup champs. You're a regular old Stephen I wasn't Hawkins. talking about the Golden Knights. I was talking about well, the you're, Kings. Well, you're talking about how much of a genius you are. You had the fucking Oilers ahead of the Golden Knights. You had the Bruins missing the playoffs. We're not geniuses here. We're pundits, <laughs> and we're both morons. So I love Fair. that you brought up Byfield. I do feel like I was maybe a little bit hard on him, which kind of goes back to my Slavkovsky take that it's so early. They're so young. He's shown, wow, I figured it out. Now he's playing with studs too. Somehow, Anshe Kopitar isn't aging. Like this guy is continuing to dominate. He's older. He's not even that fast, but he's smart as shit. He's big and he plays the game the right way. Drew Doughty is a machine. Drew Doughty was told, R.A., you mentioned this, right? Jake Muzzin said to him this summer, hey, I'm not seeing you dominate games the way you used to. Is that yeah. is that yep. what you said? Yeah, right? they were at a bar, shoot, they're at a bar shooting the shit. Like, they're really good friends. And he's, yeah, that's basically what he said. You, you used to take games over back in the day, and that kind of gave him a little kick in the pants. And, wow. and he's got four goals already. He started to concentrate more on that because he actually said he loves playing defense. He, he said sometimes if you shot a guy like McDavid down no points, that's sometimes better than scoring a goal. So oh yeah, know, he's really focused on the D. So and, so and he Dowdy he's reached another level. Like he looks he looks incredible. And like dude, this is without Brant Clark even playing. This is without this future stud defenseman. He's in the minors. He's got seven points in nine games in Ontario. They don't even need him yet. That's how good they are. I think once playoff time comes, you're going to see him in the lineup, and they're being smart. No need to rush it. Let him dominate one level before he comes up. But that's a future stud that they're going to have on the D side. Uh, that Matt Roy biz, I think you play with him, right? He's a solid play player, him. dude. Solid. He's a fucking top four defenseman that you know you're going to get. In- that's a guy like the Oilers. Jesus Christ, if they could get a defenseman like him. It's like they are a sound hockey team. I think Tom McClellan, dude, everywhere he's gone, man. He was on the bench with Babcock in Detroit. He he went to San Jose. They were good. He's now in L.A., and he's just got this team playing the same way every night. Dude, as a player, all you want to know is your role. These roles are defined. These roles, you know what you have to do every single night. You know exactly what's expected of you. There's no questions, and every single guy buys in. So this team's deep. I, I The question mark was Copley and Talbot. I don't know. Based on Talbot last year, can he keep this up? With the structure in front of him, possibly. So I, I, I just think with without a guy like Brant Clark, who's in the minors, who will be there, without Arvidsson, a water Ooh. bug, he's not even playing. It's like this team... You saw that they had two great series against LA. The, I mean, Edmonton the past two years. I, I expect them to to get past the first round this year. And and if their goal, maybe these two goalies, they can't win a cup. But if somehow these guys catch lightning in a bottle, if the if the Kings won the Stanley Cup, I would not be surprised. Um, it's a hard team to play against, and that's the only goal as a fan base is watching a team that my team every single night. If you're gonna beat them, it's gonna be tough sledding. And. Uh- Double wrister for Rob Blake and replenishing this team. I mean, they they had their cup runs. He took over, and uh, you know it was it was an uphill battle. But did they draft and develop like rock stars, and then found the guys to put through trade around Kopitar and Doughty so they could go out as three time Stanley Cup champions? Book it. I'm a genius. Wit's a fucking moron. Keep the change. Yeah, it was a couple of years early when they were like eighty to one a couple of years ago. A um, couple other notes on, on the Kings. Uh, Byfield's still only 21 years old, man. This kid's like still still a pup out there. A horse. Doughty leads the NHL with uh, 26 minutes and 7 seconds per game. Uh, 7 seconds more than number 2. And he's 5 minutes and 6 seconds more than the next King on the roster. So, fucking, he's, you know, he's up there still playing like a horse out there. Also, too, uh, the Kings have only played one division game, a shootout loss to Vegas. So, they haven't even played all those division weaklings yet. Three worst teams in the league right now, uh, points wise. Seven points for Calgary, five for Edmonton, one for San Jose. So if they're still stinking, man, they can load up on points going down the line here. Next up, I just said San Jose, the Sharks. It's bad, man. Oh, it's bad. Uh, oh, I mean, nobody I think had I, a- could, I could make this team. 
<laughs> Wit, I could play for the San Jose Sharks and not look out of place right now. They need a goalie? <laughs> Uh, yeah, nobody had him going to the playoffs, but it's been ugly after 11 games. Uh, it was already the worst start in franchise history. Now they're tied uh, for the NHL record with the 11th straight loss to start the season. Uh, they lost their 10th game to Vancouver, 10-1. to The next night, 10-2 to to Pittsburgh. That place is, I mean, there can't be more than 4,000 people in there. A couple people sent pitches. Uh, it's just bad right now. How much longer is they going to be this bad biz? I mean, what are the fans waiting? Three season. years, four years? I mean, did, it's did, just fucking ugly. Did I hear a stat they haven't? Won a game uh, since uh, April Fools. April first, yeah. April first of last year. <laughs> they haven't won a regular season game since last April. Uh, it's pathetic. Um, I'll say this though, man, they're doing it right. You might as well just get shit and and be able to draft in, in, in the top two picks. I know it's not guaranteed, but I they should. They should guaranteed. You could be three. They should get. They should have sixty balls in that fucking thing for how bad they are right now. <laughs> right, it's it, it's they they have six six defensemen out there. Uh, Ra thought they had goaltending until he mushed them. You're the ward hog. <laughs> and <laughs> as far as guys up front, I I feel bad for Duclair having to go over there and 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 deal with this. I mean, Hurdle, he's got what six or seven years, or what does he have seven years after this left on his deal? Logan Hurdle Couture, would look great in Boston. He'd be a perfect <laughs> perfect. How are you fit gonna get Boston. Hurdle? Uh. Trade something. You can't. You, <laughs> picks. You want they want that, picks. They're loaded up for the future. You want that trade? You want I to would take do on that, that deal? I don't think it's that bad. I think he signed eight times eight. So he, he eight as far, million? I think his cap hits only eight. Didn't he sign an eight times eight? That's a high hit, dude. Not for a first line center. I would consider him a first line center. But just overall, guys, I, I don't know what else to say about it. They're just they're 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 not good. The big deal selects could probably beat them. That's how bad they're playing right now. Yeah, it's just so tough. And I, I mean, I was on a bad team, couple bad teams. Um, and it's it's just exhausting. It, it just it just wears you down. And going to the rink is. I mean, thank God this isn't in Canada. Uh, I mean, at, at least it's a little easier for these guys to hide away from the rink, right? It's just a different. It's a different set up fan wise you're not running into that many people who recognize you and you're just you're going in every day to work man you got no success to really build on you got no success to look back on to feel good about yourself and so it's like it's i mean guys you you lose an nhl game 6-1 the locker room after it's a nightmare dude you're losing 10-1 10-2 that is that is like i mean it's been 50 years since a team gave up 10 goal 10 goals two games in a row 50 years and i i said they had the chance to be a top five worst team of all time i mean they're looking at a, at a at a rate of like being maybe one of the worst if not the worst we've seen at least since i don't know the 70s or 80s it, it's just a depressing thing for a player a coaching staff and <clears throat> dave quinn i am openly friends with dave quinn this ain't on him and it's it's not it's like not even really on Mike Greer. I mean, you're doing it the right way. You're rebuilding. I think the owner's probably thinking, "What the fuck is Apparently going on here?" The owner is losing his mind right we now. We have no because like you you got no fans. That's the worry. Like we got no we got no ticket sales. We got no merchandise being bought. We have a disaster financially. But if you look at like the future, at least yeah. The problem is you can't even bank on getting the first overall pick. It's not even a guarantee. That's the scariest part. So I just feel for the players. I mean, these guys are getting paid well, but dude, to be like failing over and over and in fantastic fashion, that is an exhausting thing to look at. And I just remember, I mean, at least the weather's nice there in Edmonton when we were so bad. It's like, holy fuck, it's minus 30 and we can't win a game. So I feel for the guys. It's not going to change. It's not going to get any better. Couture's out, but it's their defense. It's their goaltending. And, and I, I just, I see zero, like, defense being played in their own zone dude it's, it's like a power play for the other team all game i've never seen that in this league looks like six klingbergs out there <laughs> <laughs> playing with their well, sticks upside down now wait you said it though they're all getting paid handsomely cue the is it woody harrelson the 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 meme where he's wiping his eyes with all the money <laughs> is it woody harrelson is uh, that who i'm thinking of I, 
Um, I, I, I don't, don't know I, that I, meme. I don't know. I, I, I know the thing to talk about, but I can't I can't see the face. Uh, have either of you two been on, on a team that was like really bad a lot, like lo- was losing like this? Well, not like yes. this, but six, yeah, seven I just in a row. said I was like, all right. No, I know I, I was going to get to it. So, <laughs> what, like, when you say it's a night a nightmare in the locker room, like, like describe what, what's going on. So, like, oh, it's mi- it's it's miserable. You're dead silent. You finish the game. Everyone gets undressed. There's no music. You are dead silent. Then in Edmonton, twenty reporters come in. And you got to answer all these questions and you got to regurgitate the same bullshit and the same. We got to play together more. We got to figure out our power play. It's Groundhog Day when the sun never comes out. It's zero, zero laughters happening. And at some point, you, you, you at least get with the guys like, you know, the night before a game on the road, at least like the game hasn't been played yet. Like we got to we got to play well tomorrow. But there's also a lot of jokes like we're going to get smashed tomorrow. <laughs> we're playing Vegas in Vegas. We give up eight goals a game. We score one goal a game. We're going to get throttled. And over time, it's just it's crushing to guys. And then you also get into the fact of like any young guys they do see in the future that isn't exactly how you want to learn to be an NHL player. Like you get accustomed to losing. That's 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 a cancer right there. It's 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 just it's a disaster to try to go into your job every single day knowing that no matter what you're gonna fail. So it wears on you mentally and it wears on you physically. Um, Ari, yeah. I I played in uh, yeah. Saginaw with the Spirit. I think it was my first year there after we've been sold from North Bay and we were 500 after 10 games. We were five and five. And then we finished the season with 10 wins. So um, it was miserable. Uh, I would say that there was probably about six or seven fights and practices that year. So the frustration just mounts and it's just, yeah, it makes for a, a miserable, miserable experience. And keep in mind, we weren't wiping our eyes with money back then. We were making 50 bucks a week. So, uh, and eating, eating soggy subs. Wipe, so not a good experience. McDonald's that? gift certificates. <laughs> yeah, ex- yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I guess Canadian, Mike Canadian tire money. I guess Mike Greer met with the team today and said, like, this is beyond unacceptable. Like, I'm seeing things, like, that will not fly. Guys won't be here, which some guys are probably like, please, God, get me out of here. But yeah, Hurdle's her- asking to get sent to the Barracuda. <laughs> <laughs> no escrow. Yeah. <laughs> did I, did we get confirmation? It's a shitty situation, though, because I don't think we've any of us have ever seen something like this. To start anyway, uh, no, did we get start. confirmation? Hurdle making eight times eight. Uh, I was eight point one, but yes. You oh, were... uh, well, look at me again, nailing it, hockey genius. Yeah, Woody Harrelson meme. <laughs> uh, yeah, Fuck what you already you. said. <laughs> you already said what Bruins and nineteen sixty five last team to give up uh, ten plus goals in back to back games, and this is from uh, Big Head Hockey on Twitter. He's got a nice little account there. Uh, for the fifth, it was the fifth time in thirty years that a team is allowed. Two, two, yeah, two games with ten or more numbers. Goals. <laughs> but fucking, they did it in eleven games. The, the other teams all it took all season for them to get either two or three, you know, fucking games with ten goals scored. They did it back to back in just eleven games, man. I feel like we're piling on them, but you know, these are some stats that indicate how bad the they are. Numbers have your balls in a vice right now. I know what you I'm, just I'm, said I'm, made zero sense. No sense. All right. Uh, so in the last thirty years, what five, five teams have lost. I'm sorry. Yeah, two games. In a, two games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, is a, this is incredible. I don't, I don't this even is unbelievable. The show no, anymore. all right. Just shout yeah. out. Just shout out. No, you're the goaltenders for the San Jose Sharks. It. Just shout out the San Jose Sharks goaltenders right now. Kakin and uh, Blackwood. Love oh, it. Shout out. I want to hear this stat. I don't care yeah. how okay. long it takes. Right. Five times in the last thirty years, with five teams have given up. 10 plus 10 or more goals in two games in the season, at least two games in the season. Anaheim just did it twice back to back and San Jose. Games play. Oh, <laughs> no. Oh my God. Oh Try my again. God. Uh, <laughs> San Jose. So do you get it now? Basically? No. Like, no. no. Oh, okay. I, I have, I feel like I have so, a brain tumor after listening to your fucking numbers. Okay. All four, so four other teams have lost games. Well, they gave up 10 goals tw- twice during the season, okay? It took the whole season for them like, to lose either two or three times. One, one team did it three times. <laughs> Anaheim did it twice in the first 11 games of the season back-to-back. Anaheim, he said it. fucking <laughs> Anaheim again. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Restart it. Restart it and fucking say it again. Love it. 
<laughs> oh my god! All right, All right, should we breathe like the putting experience before you do this one? Yeah, that helped. <laughs> I don't know what movie I can do that you, that nobody saw, so I can make another weird reference. Did, nobody knew that fucking movie too. I, I don't think we can out. move on unless he gets it. Right. No, okay. no. Okay, teams another five hour the, episode. Team teams in the last thirty years to allow ten goals against our opponent and two two. <laughs> You got me all fucked up with. I, I no, 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 no. You got yourself fucked up because this was I, before. Let's do it again, guys. This is literally Herb Brooks in Miracle after they tied Norway again. <laughs> Fifth time in 30 years, a team has allowed 10 plus goals in two or more games. San Jose Sharks did it within 11 games in the season, and they did it back to back. All the other teams did it. Like spaced out over the over the whole season where they let up ten plus goals. So, uh, I f- I feel Sometimes like I just watched the I cap. watched the that was the the ending of Braveheart. I just watched the final battle scene. <laughs> fucking Rudy, I love it. All right, the year of uh, the hog, buddy, providing all the entertainment. I fucking freedom! love it. Freedom, yeah. Minus forty three goal differential uh, is the NHL worst ever through uh, eleven games in the season. That's tough. All right, we're beating up, beating them up enough. They do got a lot of money coming off this uh, next season, so hopefully they can get some pre agents out there. We'll see what happens with the old shocks. Uh, Wit, you got uh, Butchagross had a little trade off for you on Twitter last week. Did you read it yet? Yeah, I read it. Um, I'm not trading Leon. Uh, yeah. That would immediately mean Connor's like, I'm out of here, and. I didn't hate. I didn't hate the idea. I love Portra. I don't like Allmark. No, I, the trade wasn't wasn't enough for me. But the Edmonton Oilers right now, guys, are beyond a fucking disaster. I mean, this is something that no one, not even a hockey genius like Biz, saw coming. This is something that is so beyond the realm of possibilities before this season started. If you're somebody out there who have always said they're a two man team. They'll never win a Stanley Cup. I'll, I'll give you that. But nobody saw this. And and I hate to do it. And there's a bunch of different things I'll get into. The goaltending, you guys, I, I don't care what they do with their defensive zone structure, getting McDavid and Leon going again, figuring out what they need to do five on five, no matter what. Until they get a goalie, dude, they're done. They have no chance. The game Saturday against Nashville, Novak has a breakaway. I need a save, Campbell. Nope. Their save percentage. We just heard R.A. mumble through (laughs) the most insane defensive statistics in the history of hockey. The Edmonton Oilers goalies are worse than the San They have Jose a worse Sharks. save percentage than they the San Jose Sharks' tendies. They have the 32nd out of 32 teams' save percentage in the NHL. I don't care what you do, who you have, you will not win games. Like I, and, and here's the thing. Stuart Skinner, I think, has a bright future. He's young. He's a second-year player. He should be playing as the backup. He should be learning the NHL learning how you need to compete in the NHL to be a successful goalie as a backup, starting 20 to 30 games a year, okay? They don't have another guy. Campbell is a disaster. I feel bad. This is the worst part of the job is calling guys out. He's horrible. This signing has not worked out. You can get into Ken Holland at another moment. This signing is a disaster. Their goaltending gives them no chance, and I'm not making excuses for the other parts of the team, okay? Because right now, no matter how many goals they score, they're going to lose. That's just a fact, and they can't score. On to Connor and Leon. I don't really understand what's going on. If you told me Leon would go eight games without a goal, I'd say you're smoking crack. If you told me (laughs) Connor would have five games without a goal, I'd say you're hanging with R.A. It's a disaster. (laughs) And even before Connor McDavid got hurt, he didn't... he didn't look like himself. I, I I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here. If you ask other Oilers fans, just something's a little bit off. The puck handling, the speed burst. Even Biz, you said watching, it's just it's not the same Connor McDavid. And now maybe the injury has something to do with it at this point, but even beforehand. And and, and listen, before the season, Woodcroft decided to change the defensive zone structure. They they, they I, I I guess they looked to at what? the team. To what? Not play any? 
I don't. Well, now they're back to a hybrid of like zone and man on man. Before the season, they tried to go completely zone. He switched it back before the Heritage Classic to a hybrid system, and it looked good that game. I thought we were ready to take what, like off. an Indica Sativa hybrid? Like what kind of hybrid are we talking here? Hybrid of man to man and zone. Oh, That's okay. That's exactly what we're talking about here, as I oh. just said. So oh. that doesn't work either when the goalies don't save the puck. Okay, they have guys. Ryan McLeod, he's done nothing. Absolutely nothing. He's fast as shit. He skates around. He doesn't do anything. Okay? They got a, a decor that is a nightmare. They got DeHarnay. You're the sixth defenseman. Uh, apparently, Manson loves him. He plays a decent amount. You're the sixth defenseman. Your job is to not get scored on, to be solid defensively, be good on the PK. You can't be trying to make plays with the puck that end up directly in the back of your net. You can go out there every single shift and be solid defensively and flick the puck off the glass out of the zone, and there'll be no complaints from anyone. Yeah, the occasional fan will say, oh, he's never going tape to tape. Well, if he's battling defensively and he's not giving up scoring chances, that's fine. That's your job. You're the sixth defenseman. Nope, he's turning over. They got Cody Cece, Pee Wee Hockey. Do not pinch without the third man high behind you. Nope, I'm going to pinch up here. It is literally a comedy of errors every single time you watch them play. They, they have no clue how to play defense. Every game, I'm telling you, Biz, I watch every Oilers game. Tonight they're playing Vancouver, Monday night. Every single game they give up, I swear to God, 15 grade-A chances off the rush. Like, Three on threes where the forward's back. Somehow, boom, wide open shot in the slot. Somehow, puck to the net, banging home a rebound. It, 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 it's, it's infuriating. It's, it's like watching like young kids just skate around without any clue what to do. And when your power play is like basically your savior last year and it's still solid but not winning you games because you can't get a save, it all adds up to a disaster. And when I said before at the beginning of this struggle, it's okay, they're going to get out of this, they're going to make the playoffs, I, I don't know if they're going to make the playoffs now. I mean, dude, they in the next 10 games, if they go 3-7, and seven, dude, they're done. They're done. They have no, they have no chance. This should, be a, this should be a better help, uh, better help ad. <laughs> and like okay, you, like we have to get pay to each one of our listeners fifty bucks to listen to you vent. To, to you get to Woodcroft. Are See they your th math. therapists at this point, or what's going on here? Woodcroft has the second most wins. I, I think that's correct. Second most wins in the NHL since he became head coach, going into this season. Well, dude, I don't know what you're doing now, but it isn't working. So this is like, there's not one person to blame. The goaltending for me is easily the biggest problem. By the way, they got this kid, um, uh, Rodrigue, Rodrigue, I think it's Olivier Rodrigue. He was a pretty high second round pick. He's lighting up the AHL. Bring him up. Send Kemble down. Send Soupy down. Like, it's not working. Try something else. If you can't make a trade, I don't know how they're going to make a trade. Like, maybe, what do you, you want to try to get Markstrom? You think you think that Calgary's gonna Ooh, trade you Markstrom? Ooh, what? I'm just trying swap. to like I don't know goalies out there. Like what can you get? Because right now you have the 32nd. You have the worst save percentage in the NHL. Your goalie in the AHL has the number one save percentage in that league. Switch it up, dude. Try so something. I, I, so obviously, yeah, it's way too early for the Woodcroft situation. Oh, just yeah, like I, I said about DJ games, Smith. Not, but let me ask you this though. If they lose to Vancouver for the third time early in this season, tonight, we're recording on Monday night, you better believe I'm going to have my ass glued to the couch for that San Jose game on Thursday. I'm saying this right now. Clip this. Mark this. Edmonton Oilers fans, if you disagree with me, fuck you. If they <laughs> lose to the San Jose Sharks, I'm done. Sell the that's team. It. No, Sell that's, the no, team. No, 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 no. Move them I'm to Houston. I'm not a fan anymore. Is that a wow. quitter? What? Yeah, yeah, guys. I'm telling you right now. I became an Oilers fan. I got traded to Edmonton. I was horrible there. I was actually sick there for 33 games. I was unbelievable. I was feeling it. Best hockey of my life. My ankle gave out for the 15th time. Okay? I then got tortured by fans, which I had deserved. I was brutal. I was making a lot of money. The team sucked. But when I left there, I said, you know what? 
That fucking city lives for hockey. They live for it. They had the championships back in the day. All they want is a winner again, okay? And I appreciated the passion for hockey. I appreciated the fan base. While sometimes being a little out of control to guys playing bad, hey, that's business, buddy. That's Canada. <laughs> you want to throw jerseys on the ice? It's your money. Go right ahead. And I left there, and as most people would say, wow, you were tortured there. They hated you. You must hate the place. Nope. I respect that fan base, and I respect that city. And that's why I hopped on board, and I hopped on with one of the greatest players we've ever seen, and I hopped on with Leon sniping wherever he went all over the ice. I gave a lot to become a fan of that team. I got fucking 9.30 Eastern starts, and I'm up in the morning at 6.30 with my kids, and I'm grinding out every game. If they lose to the San Jose Sharks, I'm done. That's wow. it. Sorry, guys. Is that a quitter? Will you burn yeah. your jersey? You're lucky I was even a fan to begin with. Will you burn your jersey? No, I'm not a burn jersey guy. You're a classy but I, guy. But I am no longer an Edmonton Oilers fan if they lose to the San Jose Sharks. My That's only it. solution no. would be the same in which Commodore talks about all the time. You need to send in a fixer. I recommend RA. The boys need a night on the town. They need to get absolutely obliterated together. Obliterated? Obliterated? How do you obliterated, say that? Obliterated, ob- genius. Obliterated. Ob- shut the fuck up. Uh, and they just, that's how they're going to turn it around. There's nothing else but uh, an alcohol reset. And we should probably send them a case of pink Wendy to get the, the, the job done. So I think Playing enough guilty. Oilers talk. Playing I think guilty. enough. I think enough Oilers talk. And uh, I, I, I wish them all the best tonight against Rick, Rick Talk. It's Vancouver Canucks. Uh, one last thing here. Uh, the trade proposal from Bucciagross was... Uh, Trade Dry Settle in Fogel for last year's Vesna winner, which was uh, Allmark, DeBrusque, Patra, Lysel, and a 2026 first rounder. Yeah, I don't blame you for saying no to that. Wait, I wouldn't. That's from the Bruins a, side, I wouldn't want to give that up. Oh, you such wouldn't. You wouldn't give it up if you were the Bruins. I, I don't. I mean, as good as Dry Settle is, man. I, I don't know, man. That's that's fucking great goalie. You got Patra's Swayman, great. dude. I don't know. Yeah, you get Swayman. I think if yeah, you're a Bruins Swayman. fan. And and you can get Leon re-signed. I I, I think you're doing that. Mm, Leon yeah, and I Pasta think, playing yeah. together would be incredible. In- incredible trade proposal by Butchergross. He's good yeah, at I'm those. St- still in my honey- honeymoon period with Potra, so I don't want to I don't want to fucking trade him yet. All right, we got some good stuff we could talk about finally. Here. A little good, bad, and ugly. Uh, congratulations to Nationals. Ryan O'Reilly played in his 1,000th game last week in Vancouver. He's in his 15th season. He had six in Colorado, three in Buffalo, uh, close to five in St. Louis, where he won the Cup and the Cons. Might Toronto for a blip before signing Nashville. So congrats to Ryan O'Reilly, great guy, great player. Also, uh, congrats to Paul Stastny. He retired after a 17-year uh, NHL career with the Avalanche, Blues, Jets, Golden Knights, and Hurricanes. Seemed to be a really well-liked guy. With, huh? Like Everybody who talks about this oh, guy says best he's the guy salt ever. of the earth. Funny as shit, awesome teammate, great player. I remember him in college lit it up he was what maybe the last nhl player with a wooden stick i think too wow uh yeah he was second round pick back in 05 played 1263 regular season and playoff games over a 17 year career so congrats to paulie walnuts on a hell of a career uh oh there's another wild one the coyotes had a pair of uh gordy howe hat tricks last monday with uh, liam o'brien and jack mcbain each hit the trifecta it's the first time that happened two guys having a gordy howe in the same game in over 35 years, the last time Peter Taglianetti and Andrew McBain, Jack's dad, did just it for the insane same- stat. That's an crazy, insane fucking stat. Are you kidding stat. me? No, his old that- man did it. Yeah, that's yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, insane. And and what you know what team he was on uh, when he did it? Did I do guess. not. All right, the, the same franchise his son plays for, but they were the Winnipeg Jets back then. So pretty <sighs> wow. wild. Plays for the same franchise. I mean, that's the shit you can't make up. All right, can uh, you read that uh, shark stat again for me? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Ner- n- uh, Nancy, c- cancel my 2 o'clock. I'll be a minute here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nancy's my secretary that I flew her out. I'm yeah, kidding, honey. Dorian should have hired her. <laughs> how, you, how you doing? Uh, let's see. Oh, your, your boy Sid, 1,200th game the other night. I need a quick sip. Caught mouth. 1,200th game for Sidney Crosby, the first Penguin to do so. Uh, he had an assist in his game. The 10th active player to hit that number. Uh Uh-oh, here's another one. All right, what 18 players uh, have averaged a point per game when appearing in their 1,200th game? Crosby is fourth all-time on that list. Uh, Gretzky averaged 2.12 points per game. Uh, Marcel Dion, 1.37. Phyllis Pizzito, 1.27. Crosby behind him, 1.26. Eisman, fifth. 
one point two five. Tell me that crazy. fucking Crosby doesn't belong on the Mount Rushmore after re- after hearing that. In in the modern day NHL, at his age, still doing what he's doing, three Stanley Cups, all the hardware. This guy he's a top is five a greatest fucking player in the hockey. Top five, easily. I would put. Would you put him him and Stevie Y neck and neck? Oh, he's above Stevie Y. Really? Okay. Yeah. All right. Stevie's and, not coming and, and on I the pod. And I shouldn't it so like matter of fact, but I think like the game winning goal, the Olympics. Now Stevie won in uh, O two in, in Salt Lake City, I believe. But but like scoring the game winner, um, the the fact that he came in as the next one and like live like he actually he actually surpassed. He, he you think he, he surpassed? Bet, he surpassed the expectations. Legit. Like think of those expectations and remember the the commentary of him coming in and then fucking whatever it is twenty years later he actually was better than everyone said like the the fact that he beat those expectations and what he's done and like in the end Ovi's gonna break the all time goal record and Sid is Sid and we got to play with them against them and watch it and it's been absolutely glorious to see and he's still at a point per game this season even though the Penguins stink. And you know what's psychotic is I guarantee he's going to retire and he's going to do the same thing Stevie Y is doing. He's going to become a general manager and he's going to win cups doing that. The guy is a hockey genius just like me. <laughs> uh, and the same game was also uh, Eric Carlson's return to San Jose. While he was there, he led the team in goals, points, and assists. He got an assist in this game as well, a minute and 30 in. Who didn't? They scored 10. I know. Uh, hold on. This is the one I, I've been waiting for. He's the fourth Penguins defenseman in the past 20 years to begin his tenure with the club with the seven plus points through the first 10 games, joining Rick Jackman, Paul Martin, and Ryan Whitney. Low it, dog. Making Thanks, some stats. Guys. Couldn't, Thanks, guys. Fucking Thanks for throwing that one. that one out there, all right? I had a hot start. And not butchering Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Moving over to the bad biz. Johnny Hockey benched by Pascal Vincent Saturday for the final 16-07 of the third period. Uh, he said, I'm coaching a team. The guys who are going are going to play. When the game starts, it's not about your name. It's about what's on the front of your jersey and who we believe is going to give us a chance to win. doesn't matter who you are. It's about the Blue Jackets. And I didn't like his game. Harsh, harsh words from the coach. Well, he's uh, making enough money where he can probably afford to buy the team. So if I'm Vincent, I, I, he better be careful. <laughs> he better be He could probably afford to buy the, the whole organization. But uh, on a serious note, uh, yeah, it's been a very underwhelming start for the Columbus Blue Jackets. And... Uh, yeah, I don't uh I don't watch them and I don't really give a fuck. I think that it's a good thing um to kind of show the rest of the team it it doesn't matter. I mean, I think that there's some of this in in other cities like I mentioned, like fucking sit them down. I don't care who you are. If you're not doing it, I mean, they sent Kent Johnson to the minors, mm-hmm. right? That that yep. that's a that's a statement right there. They bent he benches Goudreau for the third period. Like that's accountability and it could backfire, right? If Johnny's like, fuck you, and you all of a sudden you lose the room, who knows how this goes. But you'd think he's a proud player. He'll show up next game. And if he does show up and plays the way he's supposed to, all of a sudden message message given, message received, and it could possibly be a good thing for other guys to say, hey, if he's benching him, he's going to bench my ass too. Yeah, 11.05 of ice time. It's the second lowest of uh, his 693-game career. No shots on goal, one shot attempt. Uh, and then the third period, there were two power plays in a pulled goal. He didn't get out there. That's uh, sending a message, I would say. Uh, Freddie Anderson, he's going to be out of action for a little stretch here. He had a, a blood clotting issue that needed to be addressed uh, from the team. It's unknown how long he will be out. Uh, so the team signed Yaroslav Halak to a free agent try- tryout. And Peter uh, Koch- 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 Kochkikov, uh, he's exempt from waivers, so they're probably going to keep him down the minors and keep an- Anthony Roger up, with, assuming uh, Halak sticks around for a while. Uh, in Washington Center, Nicholas Backstrom, he's going to be stepping away from the game to focus on his health and figure out what's next for him. Uh, he's been with the Caps for his entire 17-year career, 1,244 regular season and playoff games. Of course, the Stanley Cup uh, a couple of years ago, and he had that uh, hip smoothing surgery. Uh, what you said, that's a tough one for some guys. It's uh, the recovery. Or no one's ever come back again. from that and been, been like the same again. It's just... yeah. Uh, Jovanovski had it and couldn't really go after a while. And I think the same thing for Backstrom at this point. So it's shitty to think. I mean, Biz said he was going to light it up this year. So I guess the genius was was wrong on that one. But 
in the end, he gave a valiant effort, right? The guy worked his bag off to come back from something like that. And w once your brain's telling your body what to do and it's just not happening anymore, it's a shitty feeling. So I, I, I give him credit, but it, it just could, couldn't, get the, couldn't get the wheels going anymore. Yeah, it's, it's getting old sucks, man. A couple of quick sussies here. Uh, Charlie McAvoy got four-game suspension for a hit to the head of Oliver ekman Lassen versus uh, Panthers last week. I don't know, tough... Tough play. I definitely deserved the suspension. I don't know. Four was probably in line with what they gave. The, uh, what's his name the week before? Who, uh, who got the floor the week before? Brain fighting. And the defense in uh, Rasmus yeah, and, Anderson. Anderson. Yeah, he, he appealed. They didn't take any games off. I, I assume that's probably going to happen with, with uh, McAvoy and also Andrew Mangiapane. He got a one-game suspension for cross-check and uh, McCann on Seattle. Uh, all right, boys. We're going to send it over to a Trunk fan right about now. This guy's great Twitter follow. Business wiz wizard, tech wizard, all that good stuff. So... Enjoy Trunk Fan. Yeah, if you're wondering who it is, he came on a year ago. It was excellent, and we wanted to have him back on. This is a great conversation that isn't really hockey-related, but I, I think if you give it a chance, you'll enjoy it. He's got some amazing knowledge on all these different subjects, a fun guy to talk to, and so check it out right now and follow him on Twitter. All right, folks, before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. I've been going to shows, games forever, man. Dave Chappelle just across the way the other night. Boom. Game Time hooked it up with tickets. Red Sox all summer. Boom. Hooked it up. Bruins started up. Celtics. Anything in this area, Game Time takes care of you. Boston always has concerts going on. Always good stuff. That's why we use Game Time all the time. They have last minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals. Easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All in prices show your total upfront so you know you're getting a great deal without hidden fees. Buy tickets in seconds with two taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account. And use code CHICKLETS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code CHICKLETS for $20 off your first purchase. Download game time today. Last minute tickets. Lowest price. Guaranteed. Well, it's nice to have this gentleman back for his second appearance on the show. You've probably seen him on Twitter with an informative thread about business, tech, entertainment, or most likely AI. And he's here today to break down a few things for us dummies. It's great to welcome back to the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Trunk Finn. How you been, buddy? What's new? I'm very good. Thank you for having me back, guys. Listeners, thanks for having me again. Uh, as I was sharing with the guys just before we started and hopped on, it's been almost exactly a year. It was November 15th, 2022, when uh, we recorded that episode about uh, FTX and SPF. And what I will say uh, has kind of bookended almost like cinematically was he was a found guilty, Sam Bankman-Fried, as, uh, as anybody watching business media has probably seen over the past week, uh, seven charges uh, relate to fraud with investors, uh, lenders, and customers. But here's the crazy thing. When I came on last year and I w went on, like I took, I had five Red Bulls before I hopped on and just ranted. <laughs> like, guys, oh, we know. Yeah. We know. <laughs> <laughs> like, thank you for letting me rant. And um, I'm starting this with a rant. But uh, the, the reason I'm doing it is because when he uh, uh, they found him guilty, it was a year to the date of an article that was written by a crypto uh, publication called Coindesk that basically blew up the entire operation. So it's very cinematic there. And then we were kind of bookending it nicely here. Yeah, but Trung, but the guy who who ended up spilling the beans or starting the quote unquote rumors, hasn't his crypto company also went bankrupt in the meantime? Yeah, you're referring to CZ on Binance? Uh, yeah, uh, he has also been uh, under investigation by the US government uh, related to uh, not quite exactly similar things, uh, but he, uh, CZ, uh, was actually a Chinese Canadian cat. At one time, he claimed he was as rich as Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk on paper. This was when like Bitcoin was at its peak peak. And I know I remember last time talking, I know Biz, you, I know you got a couple BTC just given <laughs> to you with a uh, given uh, randomly on some uh, things. I don't even know if you look at it. 
You mentioned that you had been given like one BC. Buddy, I had $3,000 in FTX <laughs> that we won through a, an NCAA Final Four appearance by a dark horse that we picked. I want SBF. I want him to get the electric chair. I want my fuck. I want my $3,300 back. These Bitcoin bros can't be fucking trusted. And that's why we got you on, buddy. Okay. I, I, wait, I saw that you were teeing up a question. I wanted to be, uh, before I go on another rant here related to kind of what Biz said about uh, the, the sentencing. Yeah, I'm well, well SBF, I mean, what an absolute goon. But my <laughs> question is, so if people don't know, Michael Lewis is a very famous author. He wrote yeah. Moneyball. He wrote The Blinds, the book about the blind side, the Michael Orr story, which ended up, I don't know what happened with that. He wrote um, something else, Ari. What's his, uh, Liar's Poker. He's, he's yeah. written a lot of pretty amazing books. And he was actually given like full access to Sam Bankman Friedman or whatever his name is like a while ago before any of this went down. And he's, his book about the entire process, which he saw firsthand, has just come out. And I saw he gave an interview with 60 Minutes where he actually said that SBF's like a misunderstood guy, which got people in an uproar. So what is going on with that book? Have you had a chance to get a copy of it in terms of Michael Lewis, like almost defending him in a way? It's actually quite sad in the business writing community because Michael Lewis was like, he was like the Michael Jordan of writing, yeah. like business writing. Like all those books you mentioned, uh, Liar's Poker, The Big Short, which had that incredible film of Steve Carell. Love that the, movie. The 2008 financial crisis. Like no one was better than Michael Lewis at taking complex financial shenanigans and making it accessible. And you mentioned though something, the other side, which is a very relevant uh, story because- that book was about, it's about two things. It was about a, a white family taking in a black uh, football player and uh, helping him graduate, go to the NFL. And that came, about a month ago before yeah. uh, Michael Lewis's new book about SPF came out, Michael sued that family to basically say, hey, like the way that that adopting uh, was set up, conservatorship, I didn't have rights to any of these films. Like I haven't seen a dollar. And uh, what it later basically came out was that some people knew this, but it really blew up when Michael sued uh, uh, the family that was written about on the other side is Michael Lewis is very close to that family. So that's relevant here because he has a history now of writing these books that become extremely popular where his relationship with the subjects might be a little bit, you know, yeah, there's some directly. sketchiness Talk there. You think yeah, he's right? banging SBF? <laughs> <laughs> Please. That guy makes me look like Gable. Trunk, everybody was fucking everybody anyway in that I whole know, thing. That, so this isn't that far-fetched. I will tell you what's funny because he spent, when SPF was under house arrest, as you guys might remember, shortly when we spoke last year, November 2022, he was allowed to be in house arrest at his parents' place uh, near Stanford in uh, California. And Michael Lewis spent hundreds of hours with him, like inside the house, right? And I'll say two things. Uh, which framing is exactly what, the media, uh, a, a lot of like people I respect the media are saying this like, man, Michael Lewis like burnt like a 30 year reputation, right? Yeah. You know that famous saying is like, it takes a lifetime to create a reputation, but then one day to ruin it. That's kind of what he did. And I, I don't, I don't fully understand it. The, the only thing I can uh, frame it with him is that all of his characters and all the books we talked about, he does characters that are typically the underdog, right? Like, uh, uh, take the big short. It was basically some, uh, there's like an autistic hedge fund manager that was taken on Goldman Sachs, right? Like that was the framing of it. And then um, uh, the money Brad ball. Brad Pitt money ball. Yeah, exactly. It was about Billy Bean uh, with this small market uh, MLB team that outsmarted the Yankees or outsmarted the big money teams, right? So the problem with SBF was that this was one of the first times where he wasn't the underdog. Like when he started writing this story, SBF was on paper worth like $10 billion, right? And uh, was considered the greatest entrepreneur of his generation. So I think Michael Lewis, A, probably was way too close to SBF, but he also isn't used to writing this type of story. I think this SBF story was like kind of outside of the purview of this underdog thing. And he kind of basically wanted to make him look like an underdog when yeah. the reality was this guy had everything went to MIT, both his parents are Stanford professors, was given all the money by every VC in the world, and it looked like nobody asked any questions, right? So in terms of um, being convicted, and now we wait for sentencing, like, could you give a guess on what you think happens? And, and like, 
I mean, are other people that were involved with him going down? I know his smoke show girlfriend actually dropped the dime <laughs> on him, so I don't know. Who, I, yeah, I, I, I don't, know, I don't really know. Like, uh, will other people take the fall, or is this all going to go down on this guy? Well, the fact that he went to trial was already kind of a, it was so it was so yeah. SBF of him to go to trial, right? <laughs> because you go to trial first of all. That court in the uh, New York, Southern District of New York, they have a 98% conviction rate, which means if you're going to, they're all, they're taking a trial to win, right? They're not going to uh, like go to trial for you to, to, to beat them, right? That's not the purpose. Like they're only going to go, they have a very high probability of win. So people are just like, man, like this guy, there's something about him, right? And his entire upbringing or like his, uh, kind of the mythology around him as FTX was blowing up, right? As we discussed last year this time, FTX became on paper this $40 billion crypto exchange. It renamed Miami's uh, uh, Heats Arena. Steph Curry, Tom Brady, Giselle, all got fat sponsorship deals, right? So there you think that's person- what caused the divorce? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I've seen some pretty gnarly memes uh, <laughs> suggesting as much. But uh, I think... Um, to to your question, is uh, with, it's like why would he even first of all why would he even go to trial? It's just his person, his whole personality was about risk taking, right? So he's like, okay, if there's like a 05 percent chance I can win this instead of you know going to prison or like just take a plea deal, take twenty years, right? He's like, fuck it, I'm gonna I'm not gonna take the plea deal. I'm gonna so go cocky with the one. Wait that's a minute, what I you mean, you. Right? You think you think with one of the biggest fraud cases probably in the history of the planet, I don't know where it ranks as far as money, that they would have probably given him a 20-year plea deal if he would have just confessed to everything and 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 opened up about how it all went down? Well, actually, to, to answer your question, uh, do you guys remember he took the stand a couple of uh, days ago? You probably saw yeah. memes of like the, the sketch artist. So he they made him look stand, like a right? man missile. <laughs> Must have paid him a lot. <laughs> He, he looked, looked like, like Tom, Tom Brady. Brady in that. He like Tom Brady. <laughs> is well, Tom Brady SBF? Is that, is yeah. that what's going on? <laughs> no, it's all coming out. But the thing about him taking the stand, though, is like you, you see this all the time in like movies and just like any legal things. Like don't take the stand, right? Because the prosecutor will just destroy you. They will just destroy you because they have all this evidence that he was, you know, openly sharing with the world. But uh, no, specifically about him taking the stand and would they've offered a plea deal, Biz? Probably not. And the reason they probably wouldn't even offer a plea deal was because, or if they did, it would have been a really tough plea deal, was because he had the two people flip on him, right? CTO, uh, ex-girlfriend. Those took the plea deal. Like those people took the plea deal and like were ready to snitch on him. Everybody turned on him. And yeah. even it, it was one of the like people close to him told him like not to do any type of media when this originally broke, but he refused. And it probably speaks a lot to his ego. And on top of that, when people were asked in the midst of the trial about like his personality and, and his persona, I guess he said to one of the people that was, was on trial that he thought at the point in his mid twenties that he had a 5% chance of becoming president right. of the United States of America. So the level of delusion that this guy has is, is pretty high. And then in the midst of the trial for a guy who's a, basically a genius and has an insane memory and is known for his memory, he said 120 times, I don't recall to, exactly. to answers to questions. One of them being the year before, it's like, well, you were on a private plane going to the Super Bowl with these people. And then he couldn't seem to remember. So he's obviously a liabetic and didn't do himself any favors by doing these interviews when it, this all came about. And he got arrested. Exactly. Well, exactly. Because the prosecutors were just every time he said, "I don't recall," they're like, "Okay, well, we do recall because you literally said this on this day and like <laughs> tweeted about it, right?" But uh, wait, to so your question is, uh, uh, the years is uh, uh, what I'm. Well, this is here's a big twist actually. When I spoke to you guys last year, uh, it looked like at that at that point in time that the uh, that the people that the customers that got their money taken would get maybe ten to fifteen cents on the dollar. Okay, something insane has happened in the past year. So SBF stole some of this money and was making uh, venture capital investments in the AI space. So oh if you guys, I know you've been following just like even anyone that has seen anything about artificial intelligence over the past 12 months knows that that is like the new hottest sector, right? One of his bets might make the uh, uh, customer deposits Complete whole or 80, 90 no million. way shit. It, it's insane. It's this company called Anthropic. So you might have seen them if you Google Anthropic, 
Google, so funny enough, if you Google it, Google invested just last week at $2 billion. Amazon has agreed to invest up to $4 billion. This company is a competitor to OpenAI. So uh, this won't actually change him going to jail, but yeah. I think what it says is that the judge, because he has until March to make the sentencing decision, um, on the table by the letter of the law right now is I think 110 years if they run everything concurrent. That's just max, right? But like people do sentencing guidelines and things that you have to take into consideration is like repeat offender, was this violin? Uh, does he have an opportunity uh, at any point in his life to make a positive contribution, right? Like versus that, like say a Bernie Madoff, uh, Bernie Madoff was in his, I think, late 60s when he ripped off, ran the biggest Ponzi scheme ever, I think over $100 billion at one point. Um, they were just like, well, this guy, honestly, probably going to die in prison anyways, right? And he did die in prison. Whereas SBF is, uh, I mean, I've heard some stuff and I don't want to paint him in like a sympathetic light because I think he was a straight up criminal and did some really criminal shit as, uh, you know, uh, uh, his jury appears uh, have uh, chosen to decide. And uh, But I have heard him when they asked him about, uh, you know, what is it like to the thought of being life in prison, he's, you know, he's reflective about it. And he's like, is there some world where I can make this better? So I might, I, I have no, I'm not a legal person. Yeah. I'm saying I'd imagine 20, 30 years at a minimum is what he'll get. So he'll still come out at like 50. So uh, is there any part of you, um, not to put you on the spot, but like it's been, it's been pretty open in terms of him making enormous, enormous donations to politicians. And like, for me, is it not crazy to think that those politicians should almost have to pay the money back to maybe victims of the entire FTX scam? Is that too unrealistic to think? Or like well, she's the already spent it on ice cream <laughs> or stocks, right? Um, no, I, I think it is a hundred percent, uh, a valid, question and people are raising it okay i think what happens with that though becomes i mean it, this isn't gonna be surprising at all but he was in he was the second biggest donor to the democratic party right like, yeah that one, like, like the, there was a non-material reason that he contributed to joe biden being elected like if you just look at the donations yeah. or not necessarily like about supporting that bid and like he had said himself prior to all this thing blowing up, he was ready to spend a billion dollars on 2024. No so, shit. Yeah, like we're talking, his mother was actually a bundler for Democratic donations. Like she ran a pack for the Democrats. So I don't know how And I'm not should. even trying to make it political. Like, no, no, no. I'm no, just saying, wait, like, wasn't it, which newspaper, and it was a big one at the time, ended up writing like a, a New York piece Times, trying to- Multiple puff pieces. Like, come multiple. on. Multiple. It's a fucking joke. Dude, it's, it, it was a left-wing cabal. Like, uh, I mean, cabal is a hard word, but because he actually was donating to also Republicans, but through dark pools. And But the whole point was that him and his co one of his co-founders, they were donating like ultimately to win favor with politicians so they could get a regulatory protection around FTX, right? Like we discussed it last year was the whole idea leading up to this blow up. And we mentioned CZ at the top. CZ had caught wind that FTX, who, by the way, CZ, just as a reminder, was is the, probably the crypto kingpin in the world right now. CZ what, has a competing exchange. But CZ had also seeded SPF and was, in a way, his mentor. But he had caught wind, so-called around September, October of last year, and the blow up is in November. He had caught wind that SPF was going to U.S. regulators and being like, hey, you should look into CZ. Like, I think oh, so they're trying to take yeah. each other down. Almost. Exactly, right? So he... I wouldn't even call it a Democrat specific thing, but I think that's the most visible part of it. SBF was trying to use money to uh, manipulate the U.S. Uh, political system, which is, the, this is not conspiracy theory. Everybody knows that's how the game goes. Yeah, yeah, to buy to buy yourself some safety. It's a crazy, crazy story. But um, and, and uh, not moving on from that, but you already mentioned AI. And and a lot and I, I really enjoy following you on Twitter, which is actually incredible. I read. Did you get six hundred thousand new followers in one year? Oh, it was it was two years, two years, two years. Just amazing, amazing work by you. You've deserved Thank it. You. Reporting on all these interesting different subjects, but AI. Should I be terrified? Because I I am a little terrified, and I don't know if that's the general consensus among people out there. But I've seen people come out saying everything's going a little too fast, and that we should be worried. And other people saying, no, no, we're all good. So, in your opinion, in terms of AI, is this like something to worry about? Well, I'll, I'll, let me ask you uh, which part of AI specifically you you want to address. There's there's like I, 
The yeah, movie with Will Smith. I'll give you two options. I'll give the you two movie options. with Will Smith. Shit like right. that. No, I'll give you. Oh, wait, I'll give you two versions. Right there's the uh, there's the Terminator two. Uh, will this thing get smarter than us and take us out? Version. There's also there's the, there's the more like will they take our jobs? Because those are kind of two. So I'm more thinking about like being murdered by a robot, <laughs> or or also in a sense of these like deep fake AI videos that can make it look like I'm legit sitting there saying something I'm yeah. not. Brie comes home. She left you for a robot. <laughs> yeah, the robot I mean, actually seen, got some girth to him. A hologram of weight watching TV. You guys seen her? I mean, that's Just pretty, pretty good movie. By AI. Well, Joaquin Phoenix, right? <laughs> no, I. Uh, what I would say is, I mean, there are extremely smart people that are very concerned about AI, like Elon Musk, for example, and uh, other individuals that there. I mean, there's a non. If I'm being honest. Uh, and, and the people, the people who know the best are similar to shoes, right? You talk to any of these experts, like OpenAI, Anthropic, all these kind of companies we're talking about. If you ask them, say, like, "Hey, what's the risk that AI may take us out?" Like they, with a straight face, they'll be like, "Oh yeah, it's like five to ten percent." Like completely straight face, right? It's like, like in the sense of, you know, we have to build it safely, but we also are seeing how quickly it's advancing, and uh, they'll say, and you know, to take us out has different. Uh, connotations, but they are incredibly concerned about it. But you actually see a lot of uh, uh, similar things going on in AI, though. Like Microsoft and OpenAI and uh, and uh, Google, they're happy to sign these papers saying, like, "Hey, we need to be regulated." But part of it is like uh, the, uh, President Biden just released an executive order around AI. One thing about regulations, we just talked about FTX. Regulators entrench the incumbent because new companies can't pay for uh, to cover the regulations, right? If there's all these regulations. Like after the banking crisis 2008, what happens? All the banks got bigger because you got to file like thousands of pages of regulations. You have to have 20 people working in the regulatory department, right? So these companies now, they're basically trying to entrench themselves by asking to have, be regulated by the government. Even while they're saying, oh, yeah, this might, there's a 5% chance this might destroy the world. Please regulate us instead of us just stopping working on this. Yeah. Right? And, and, so and like, also in the midst of this, hiring people that were regulators to then work yes, for them to know how exactly. to beat the system. It's very, uh, it's quite cynical. But what I will say, like, it's accurate. <laughs> there, I mean, the, the thing, the thing that surprised me and has surprised a lot Trung's of people. Trung's gonna go missing after this interview. <laughs> exactly right, <laughs> man. Guys, I am in Vancouver at uh, what time is it now? Four thirty p.m. I do not have a death wish. I am very happy. No, no. The uh, what I would say is, so if you'd asked people ten years ago what, where they thought AI would uh, be first, as in. Where do you think artificial intelligence would replace jobs first? Almost across the board, they'd be like, oh yeah, white, uh, blue collar. We'll just have factory machines replacing everyone. Then maybe they'll do like uh, copywriting, uh, maybe some accounting stuff, and uh, maybe some legal work, because legal work is basically accounting with words, right? So things that are super structured. The last thing they'll ever do is creative work, right? Not but anymore, it's turned out in the past year, is a completely flipped. The hardest thing to do is the manufacturing stuff. It's actually extremely difficult to make robots with AI and do everything properly, right? They're advancing. But as you've seen, and like you said, with not anymore, like you've seen this stuff with uh, a chat GPT. You well, can how about the music, it. Chung? Dude, They're it's making insane. music. It's incredible. You can't tell the it's, difference. It's math, right? Because music is ultimately math. So what What else? What, what's AI really good at? It's good at math, right? So, uh, so I'll address that being like people were surprised at the parts of the economy it hit first. So that kind of throws everything out the door of, uh, hey, humans are special and human consciousness is this unique thing that cannot be recreated. I'm much more along the lines now that human consciousness can be recreated. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet, but seeing some of these outputs are just, it's jarring, right? It's absolutely yeah. jarring, the creative outputs. Chung, I just want to go back to SBF quickly. So in, in about a couple of his investments, you talked about yeah. the AI, you talked about the politicians. His girlfriend testified that uh, some of the money in the accounts went to uh, tie hookers and yeah, prostitutes. Yeah, this is an insane now, story. <laughs> do you think that my 3K went to ping pong balls being shot in SBF's face outside of uh, out of Thailand hookers' pussies? Like, do you think that's, I, a, that's a possibility? I can tell you 3K will get you a lot of ping pong balls in Bangkok. No shit. <laughs> no <laughs> So I will actually, yeah, I will. That, that story is quite crazy. He, they had a billion dollars stuck on an Asian exchange and they needed to basically get that money out. And one way they did it was, you mentioned Asian uh, Thai prostitute. They, they got a Thai prostitute to set up a trading account and 
they tried to trade against this other Asian exchange, but they had an insider in the Asian exchange where the other side tried to lose money to the Thai prostitute. It's just insane. But what ended up happening was to get the billion dollars out, they greenlit a $150 million bribe. And there is literally an Excel spreadsheet that says, it has a it has a figure 150 million and in the sub in the explainer area just says that thing <laughs> that, that's all it says like that's what it was like this is how ridiculous this whole thing got and they were also i mean they uh, apparently like stories of major drug use and like sex parties within this house in the bahamas like is that all pretty much true yeah, the I mean, tons of amphetamines. That, that's probably not that surprising. Like, uh, yeah. if you if you if you're a the house of no return, yeah. crypto style. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> I mean, tons of amphetamines. Uh, tons. I mean, any type of a. T- uh, if you got any, honestly, any engineering a team at a lot of these companies. I mean, these people are microdosing in the valley, right? Like, you and know, they're people are microdosing. Doing this yeah, shit. It's, it's just like weird shit. Microdosing was going on. what? Um, acid. Oh, no shit. Yeah, a lot of people in the valley microdose acid. acid. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild. Ari's like, can I be an idiot? (laughs) (laughs) He's like, man, I don't have a full ride. How how do you do that by microdosing? (laughs) It's possible. Uh, Biz, when he, they said that thing on that she was just saying, Biz, you would have said, oh, blamed it on Lauren Hill. <laughs> Biz is a big Lauren Hill. That that, thing, that's on that. Yeah, she's back on tour already. Your Rolling oh, Stones better watch out, buddy. Uh-oh. Fuji's, Fuji's, the classic. They're coming. Right they're, they're actually coming to Vancouver, Trunk, on oh, Sunday. Lauren Hill? Yeah, Lauren oh. Hill's coming. I think the one guy Fuji. can't get into Canada because he's got a <laughs> bunch of felonies like SBF, but uh, but the, the other two are there. Wait, are you referring to Proz? If you're yes. referring to Proz, dude. Holy shit. This story might be as crazy as SBF story. Do you guys no, know? come on. Yeah. Do you guys know Joe Lowe? No. Have you guys ever heard the name Joe Lowe? All right, let me give a spin chicklets, uh, spin chicklets listeners about this gentleman named J-H-O space L-O-W. He, at one point, had more liquid money uh, accessible to him than even a guy like SBF. He had $6 billion in his bank account in Malaysia because he had set up a sovereign wealth fund or with the Malaysian sovereign wealth fund with a dirty Goldman Sachs guy. This is the dude that financed Wolf of Wall Street with uh, Leo DiCaprio. I, I swear to God, if you guys Google Joe Lowe, you will have seen photos of him because he hung out with every celebrity in the world. Every single celebrity in the world. This dude was a huge Malaysian hitter and he stole over $5 billion uh, from, basically he used the government credit of Malaysia to raise money, stole it, and now all the citizens of Malaysia are going to have to pay, pay this back eventually through taxes and like lost opportunities. So this gentleman, the reason I'm bringing him up is one of Joe Lowe's friends was Praz from the Fugees. And Praz <laughs> is actually uh, under government investigation because Joe Lowe was so close to the Chinese Communist Party. This is literally, like literally global international. Oh, this sounds like a movie trunk. This yeah. sounds, yeah. but yeah. If he, it says he's still a fugitive. He's he's hitting. He's hiding in China. The Chi- he's an shit. asset to the country of China and the communist the Chinese Communist Party because he has billions hidden around the world, and. <laughs> This it, this guy is insane. Joe, people, Joe Lowe, the book, uh, the a very famous book called Billion Dollar Whale. And I'll, I'll tell you one more story which you guys will appreciate. So, do you guys remember the? You, have you guys seen Wolf of Wall Street? Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, do you remember the name of the gentleman? Uh, actually, Ari, you probably know. Do you remember the name of the guy they did it off of? This total scammer, a uh, total Wall Street scammer, jo- Jordan Belfort. Yes. Oh, Jordan okay. Belfort. I, yeah. 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 I, so Jordan Belfort is the subject of the movie Wolf of Wall Street. Joe Lowe got. Buddy, buddy with Leo DiCaprio. He gave DiCaprio, I think, a $15 million Picasso tra- a painting that Picasso, that Leo had to give back to the government as part of like the collecting of assets. So here's the crazy thing. Jordan Belfort, I believe, was in Cannes. He was at a Cannes film festival uh, during the, uh, they hadn't finished filming yet, but the financing of The Wolf of Wall Street had gone down. They're partying, and this guy, Joe Lowe, his whole shtick was, when I show the party, everyone needs to know I'm the richest guy here. So they used to have bottle competitions. I'm sure you guys have done bottle competitions. I know former athletes here. You guys have uh, had a good time. Yeah, smear it off. Guy I is send it over to your buddy. Yeah, he's spending $5 million a night at bottle competitions. Literally, give me every single ace of spade balls you got. Bring them out. Give me all the firecrackers and flares. Whoever brings out the most wins, right? And then Jordan Belfort looks over at Joe Lowe. And he goes, that money's stolen. 
and uh, I think he's with his girlfriend at the time. And she's like, what do you mean? He's like, nobody that earned their money would spend it this way. And he's like, that guy stole all that money. He knew. He just knew as a guy in the game that this guy was spending this money <laughs> so recklessly. He's like, I've seen this. If you earned your money, like, honestly, you would never spend it like that. A scumbag knows another scumbag. Exactly. So uh, there. So pros. There, there's the pros story. Wow. Trung, you're I mean, unbelievable, geez, buddy. Trungy unreal. baby. Bringing it no, back to spit and chicklets. All right, what do you got for him? I, I just want to ask, like, what, what's like Joe Schmo or Joe Sixpack? How is how would he use AI or what, what he needed? Or is it just for companies? I'm like baffled. I don't really understand much of it, to be honest. Do you, with you. Uh, have you guys dabbled at all? For I uh, haven't. I actually messed uh, around dabble. trying to go <laughs> on. Um, what was the page you could go and put in something and they'd write like was it was that Chat? GPT? Okay, yeah. so when I went to go, it was already like full or subscribed or whatever a couple months ago you couldn't use it anymore basically so i've never dabbled in it right. at all i would say this i would say um for white collar work um the way that it can be beneficial i mean on be honest you probably use do you guys get transcripts for your podcast done online we do like an outline before ra does it and guys go over it and, and just to know what we're going to talk about how on do you Mondays. transcribe it afterwards do you guys that run one. it through a speech to text uh, uh, a machine um, we I can't even know. speak normally, dude. <laughs> yeah, we, we have a system that does it for us. No, no, do you know? Okay, uh, that system is using AI, right? So, like, yeah, the, basically, like when you ask, when, RA, when you're asking me, like, how does a Joe Schmo use it? It's like, do you have white collar work that you hate? Do you have administrative work that you hate? AI is very good at that. So, I'll give you an example for me. I use it all the time for editing. I write a ton, mm -hmm. but I don't have a professional editor anymore. I stopped writing for Bloomberg earlier this year, so I don't have a professional editor. I edit all my work in like writing, editing, two completely different skills, right? It's very, it's like the difficult thing with a lot of white collar work is context switching. I mean, you understand too with any work you do. It's like if you're doing one task and then you switch to another task, I think research shows it takes like 20 minutes to get back to that first, just cognitively, right? Yeah, because your like, brain's oh, wired into what you were doing first. Exactly, right? You're like, Fuck, where was that's why having a kid is like the, the greatest, like it just steals you to context switching, right? You're doing anything, your fucking kid runs in the room, you're just like so disheveled, but you gotta get back to it. But context switching is actually the biggest cost for like when people say they multitask, first of all, no one can actually multitask. It ruins your train of thought and thinking. What you're what you're actually doing is that you're just ruining your ability to finish one thing and just starting something else, right? But AI is really good. For me specifically, like I'll write something. I'd be like, fuck, I got to edit this thing. And I, in the old world, I would just never edit it, right? I edit it like a week later. But now I'm just running through the AI do it. And so AI is really good at that heavy kind of lifting stuff. Trung, actually, we, we use AI on our audio now. And for something that used to take me, you know, six, seven hours trying to edit every little bit of the audio, we can run that through AI. Is it just script? No, no, it's different. It's We do it through Adobe, but we use the Adobe AI and it can clean up audio that would take me as an editor six, seven hours to fix. There you go. RA, man, right there, man. That's is how it, the is it going to help me it. peaking? Is it going to help me peaking during this interview so far with it this should, horrible it mic should. I have? Oh, well, let's thank that. Yeah, no, there's a lot of the, uh, that kind of, I, I'll tell you, actually, with the biggest use case right now, uh, I don't want to bore the listeners about, uh, about AI You're use not. cases, but a big one is uh, coding. Massive coding lift. So uh, Microsoft has a tool uh, uh, for um, coding where essentially it saves coders half the time using AI. So Okay, so my brother does coding for a living. Um, my brother Colin. Not anymore. And I, I saw all this AI talk and, and I was like almost worried. But in a sense, it, it, it won't get rid of coders. It'll just really help them. It can augment them. Certainly, uh, there will be people that, I mean, take about previous tool, right? Take Excel. Or, or Microsoft Word, even just take older ones, something from the 90s, right? When Microsoft Word and Excel were blowing up in the 90s under Microsoft, there were people that kind of refused to do that, right? They would want to do it the old way. The people that refused to do it would make a third of the salary of the person that embraced it. Yeah. And, 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 and the other thing too, though, like people also lost jobs. But the point is, these tools create more productivity. I, I will actually, uh, here's a very good analogy I think that uh, you guys will appreciate. In the 50s and 60s, do you guys remember like a show like Mad Men and like you'd have these offices and there'd be secretaries typing, right? There'd be like 20 secretaries in a room typing. So if you actually think about what those secretaries are doing or even just, a, a, it doesn't have to be female, it could be a male worker, right? What they're doing is just basically data input. So if you actually take a look at a spreadsheet and take a look at that room in the 50s with 20 people on their desk typing, a single cell in a spreadsheet is the equivalent of one person 
entering data for one cell, basically. So like the amount of productivity increase you get over decades with technology, it's massive. So the question then becomes, did we lose jobs? Yeah, we did lose jobs, but we also gained a shit ton of new jobs. Yeah. So I think that's one way to think about it. Uh, and um, I think there'll be a lot new different jobs that'll happen, but yeah, it's worthwhile embracing for people. Like, cause the cost is so low to try it. You mentioned the workplace with the, with the, the 20 typers, male or female, good cover there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, you have these amazing threads and one of the ones recently was on WeWork and how it ended up going bankrupt. Now, this was one of the most genius ideas. It felt like, you know, five, 10 years ago, whenever it was created, how did it end up going bankrupt considering it costs a lot to lease space? And this seemed like a good idea to begin with. Do you guys, do you guys own real estate? I feel like Wit owns real estate. Uh, Wait, yeah, I'm not as much as I guy. wish, but, um, Wait, but Biz, a little too? bit, uh, not commercial. I, I, I more, more like residential, Okay, not, not commercial. So I think understanding, uh, and obviously you guys in your positions, like you understand very much, like what are the key levers in uh, real estate, right? It's so like, what are the interest rates? What can you borrow? Because that's that's the main thing, right? Is like, and what you can of, borrow at. Yeah, and what you can borrow at, exactly. And I'm sure uh, everyone over the past year has seen the pain of like when that actually changes, right? Yep. So post-financial crisis, what really happened in the US economy, global economies in general, interest rates near zero. And we work is a very specific near zero type of a company. So there's this, there's a saying called the zero interest rate policy, ZERP. So that I don't, have you guys heard this term ZERP? Yep. Yeah. So ZERP is a very popular terminology in the finance world. And just people like that joke about finance because ZERP basically spoke about this period where, you know, like Uber has burnt $20 billion to become the company is. Remember when you could get a ride across New York for like five bucks because yeah, VCs were so subsidizing your ride. And now it's so expensive, right? Exactly. Or you used to be able to do DoorDash. You could, you basically get free food if you give enough referrals, right? So people just giving money away to build these businesses. Some businesses came out on the other side. Airbnb, for example, came out on the other side. It's a very uh, uh, reasonable business. It's a like $100 billion business. Positive cash flow. Uber, to date, I don't, don't even think it has turned a profit, like a, a true accounting profit. It's Jeez. burnt over $20 billion, right? Because some businesses work if you're being subsidized forever by venture capitalists uh, that are willing to give you billions of dollars, right? Uh, SBF, FTX is almost the perfect example of a company where nobody did any due diligence. They gave a guy that had wacky hair and, and it spoke well $10 billion, right? But WeWork is actually very much this. Adam Newman, the Great CEO. Show. I yeah, like the show right? a lot. This is a good show, right? So yeah. Adam Newman, who's played by Jared Leto in the show, the thing about uh, Adam Newman is if people are giving away money and you're kind of like, he's a 6'3", Israeli dude, really, really good public speaker, super charismatic. You go do something and you convince people to give you money it's there. You're not, you're not actually doing anything wrong, right? That's the game. The game being played was companies like, do you remember the show, the main uh, investor, Masayoshi san. So he had raised almost a hundred billion dollars from the Saudis. So the thing is this, when you have a hundred billion dollars, what can you even invest it in? Right? Like there's only so many things you can invest a hundred billion dollars in. Real estate is one of those things because real estate is a global asset class that could conceivably be worth hundreds of billions of dollars. So they basically burn $20 billion with Adam Newman because there aren't that many places to put it. But back to your business model question, Biz, is yeah, at a zero interest rate environment and pre-COVID, it made a lot of sense, right? A lot of opportunity to, you still have high vacancy. People aren't working from home like crazy. Uh, people, uh, a lot of companies aren't giving up all these commercial leases. Past year, how many companies have given up 70, 80, $100 million uh, 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 commercial spaces. Like Google's like, wait, it turns out we don't need this $100 million building in downtown San Francisco, right? So pre-COVID, during the zero interest rate environment, we work. Amazing, amazing potential business. And what, uh, what Adam Newman did, which was his secret sauce, was he basically convinced people that this was a technology business. So when they tried to go public, they, WeWork was assigned, or he tried to assign it, a quote unquote technology multiple. So technology companies typically have higher multiples than like a boring utility business because you get higher multiples uh, on, so whatever, call it 10 times revenue, right? Let's say a company does a hundred times, a uh, hundred million dollars a year, you assign it at 10 times revenue, so you validate a billion. That's a fairly high multiple. A utilities company, which is like your local utility, would not get 
10 times multiple yeah. on the revenue. It might get two times because it's a boring utility, right? There is no future growth. You know exactly how much money utility will always make because the government mandates it. So Adam Newman's secret sauce was he convinced people that this actually this pretty boring business, which is just real estate releasing. He like put in a couple like cold brew stations and like ping pong tables and convinced people it was like a tech company. Yep. Like that's how this, that's how they ended up burning $20 billion. And, and in the end, whether it's sports or business, it's like, it, it all comes down to leadership. SBF and Adam Newman, like ego maniacs that think they're geniuses. And even though sometimes they are, they end up fucking themselves and all their, their employees over in the end. So in terms of you personally, like your Twitter growth and now I see like Elon Musk will, will respond to a decent amount of your tweets. Like, do you remember, like, had you spoken to him but uh, before was the first time he responded to something like for you, like, holy shit, Elon's Elon's answering me now. Like, what was that like? No, no. Yeah. I never spoken to him before. And, uh, I think, I think all three of us will know from like, especially from you guys are in the barstool world, right. Is like, they built this thing internet first and he, the, the power of putting media on the internet, uh, uh, that sounds so generic, but like using internet, uh, and Twitter and these, like these platforms that don't have gatekeepers, like the New York times, Never in a million years would have hired me. I don't need the New York Times anymore, right? Yeah. I, I, I go straight to people that want to read and do my stuff. But the whole point is it's not just New York Times. It's any old legacy media. So podcasts, uh, newsletters, uh, social. You can build your own audience because there's still this element of meritocracy to it, right? It's like that's a, people listen to you guys because you guys do the best and most engaging and funniest analysis about the NHL, right? That's a meritocracy. You can't force somebody to like that. You can't. There's no amount of money that SBF could have given a random group of four people to make them the most popular podcast in the world for this uh, niche. And what, the way we know that is Spotify done a lot of great things, but they also threw money at celebrities. Remember Prince Harry, Meghan Markle? Threw them yep. $20 million. You can't Giant force, failure there. You're a giant failure. It's like there's a lot – like certain mediums like this. So just going back to your question about Elon, it's like, yeah, it's just like just writing on the internet. Elon's super active on Twitter, obviously. Obviously acquired it last year. And – it, it's less of an Elon story. It's more just like the people I've been able to meet, even just you guys, right? It's, yeah. it's amazing if you put stuff out there. And, and honestly, this sounds cheesy, but just actually be authentic to yourself because that's the only thing you can do forever. Like the people I respect and looked up to the most in the content business, if you want to say it that way, they are who they are. Dave Portnoy has been the same person for 20 years. And he... he never changed, as we all know. Whatever you think about him, I'm a huge fan. And... And and the success comes because people know what they're getting with him. But if you're just trying to chase trends and like uh, and you're, chase, you're like, counting clicks. on – Yeah, chase clicks or you're counting on Spotify to give you a $20 million deal because you're famous in some other domain. Like that's not a winning recipe. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, uh, uh, now Elon and I like uh, – yeah, just chat you know, a ton in public and – it's just, nice. uh, and it's just because, you know, the, 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 clearly the subject matter, the, the things I'll talk about, but oh, he obviously enjoys for some of it. Yeah. Basically it's proof for you that you've done a fantastic job. No, I appreciate that, man. Trong, do you think you could get him a one-on-one -on -one interview with RA? <laughs> well, RA, why well, don't you pitch it right now? What would your main RA hates his guts, be? Trung. Or a rough and rowdy, either one. Oh, RA's not, okay, uh, okay. Yeah. I'm not. I wouldn't. I'm not necessarily a muskrat. Not a big fan. It, nothing to do with him. It was. It was pre Twitter. I had a block okay. him before he bought Twitter. Not, so not he, a fan, he's convinced that our our like R is convinced that when he blocked him, Elon started fucking with his follower count yep. and all of his he engagement. Did. So there's some serious beef, one on one beef. Okay. And Elon, I know, is sitting around in a dragon lair right now, <laughs> wondering how do I get R A back on my side. Hundred percent. All right, all right. We might have to sit down. You might have to give me some preamble, so I'm not stepping on any feet here. But this sounds like a potential, high potential, uh, a buff that needs to be resolved here. But I actually, uh, I actually had a question for. Wait, go ahead, Ra. No, no, I, I just reacted to you. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say. I actually had a question for you guys around. Uh, we were talking about um, something. Bring it back to the uh, the your your podcast and the NHL is. Uh, wait, you're saying how like you know. When people are given so much money and there's kind of zero interest rate environment, it's not just about business, right? This happens in sports, right? Like, what are some examples in the NHL of where, like, there's too much cap space or 
or this is a favorite one, new owner syndrome. Whenever there's a new owner of a franchise, this is is something Bill Simmons always says. When a new owner comes in to buy a team, they just go on the craziest spending spree. It's like the Phoenix Suns did it last year when uh, Matt Ishba bought the the Suns, comes in, traded every asset possible for Kevin Durant, spent everything they had this summer to get Bradley Beal. We're like, you're kind of like drunk and you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you're not thinking, it, you're not doing the equivalent of a due diligence that a VC should have done at FTX, right? Has this happened in NHL? And like, what are these um, examples? It's a little different. Like, basically, in a sense, yeah, it is a new toy for a lot of these guys, but the NHL salary cap creates so many like logistical nightmares for quick turnaround change because you can't get rid of guys that you want to get rid of if they make a lot of money because oh, no teams can take them on. And, and then also, in a sense, like, you have a. Uh, a new whatever job to to get these fans back in the team's corner and for the most part when a team does change owners it's like something has gone wrong but usually like there's been some dark days so the guy in ottawa just comes in and he's all fired up that's a different story that we already went into this podcast but he can't do that much besides maybe clear house in terms of the people running the organization. That's what we kind of see in hockey where a new owner will come in and he just kind of wants his business to be his. So whether it's a new president, a new GM, a new coach, that's like kind of what they can do. But it, it, it can't be like basketball because you can't just get rid of all these guys because of the salary cap. So is that in your, in your opinion, is that good for the sport? So we've had a lot of discussions about the salary cap. I think it creates a ton of, and these guys will step in and tell me what they think. It creates a ton of parity in the league, which is a good thing. It also creates issues in terms of no longer do we see a lot of big trades. Uh, Free agency frenzy in July 1st, where the NBA has cornered that market and free agency in the NBA is like a holiday and crazy shit goes down. The NHL, it's turned into a little bit of a, a day for depth players, right? Because the big guys, they're signed prior to their contracts ending. They don't want to allow these players to get to free agency. So it doesn't really have that huge effect of July 1st as it used to. Now, we've talked before about like an idea it's actually Keith Yandel was I think the first to say it to me that maybe one guy on every NHL team wouldn't count against the cap and that could kind of create a little bit more spending and a little bit more frenzy at free agency but as of right now the NHL is kind of locked into a salary cap and 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 core players being locked up long term ever before they're ever able to hit the the UFA market I completely agree. That was a great breakdown. Uh, the the salary cap, the hard salary cap, has clock block a lot of the entertainment as far as the trades and the free agencies. But the parity is one thing it has created. And just like Whit mentioned with the maybe one guy doesn't count towards the cap, I think that if you draft and it's homegrown talent, there should be a discount percentage wise if you keep those guys around. So the the thing the thing about the NHL too is when these GMs sign guys and they're bad deals, you get punished longer. Where in these other sports that have these soft yes. caps or no cap at all, these rich teams like the Yankees, the Boston Red Sox, they can just buy their way out of trouble. So from from an overall sense, I think that the the, the hard cap should be higher, but I like how it does create that parity. And if you're going to be a bozo GM or, or hire bad people and you're going to find yourself in trouble, you got to sit there and lick your wounds. So <laughs> and overall, Trump, even a, if... Even if an owner, a, a, a super rich owner, like they all are, but like crazy rich and didn't care about the spending. And he was like, all right, uh, Tomas Hurdle in San Jose, like we just signed him eight, nine million a year. I want to get rid of him where he could be like, all right, I don't care. I'll just pay him. He's gone. Well, what happens is the cap hit stays on against the team. Right. So you can buy a guy out and he's no longer a part of your organization, but the salary cap, the thing that affects everything within each team, you're still getting charged for him, whether it's uh, two thirds of it or a third of his contract. It's like you can never just get out of a problem with the NHL. So, so you still you're paying the well, it puts an onus on having like really good, like general. Really? Management. Basically, the NHL has has turned into like if you don't draft well, you're dead. I, I, I'm, I now believe it's like 95% of successful NHL teams, they just have to draft well. There's no other way to get guys that are um, like a, elite level talent if you aren't drafting them. So it, it's created parity it, and it's created a little boredom in terms of like just movement throughout the league. I had like two semi uh, questions related to that. It's like number one is like the question of is parity actually good for sport is I, I don't know my true feeling on this, but I'll just have two examples, right? NFL. Um, obviously 
periods where a lot of different teams win, even the Patriots, despite their dynasty, that split over basically two segments of time, right? And then we're in basketball, so many dynasties, right? And then that's still despite the amount, like Jordan in the 90s, uh, the Warriors recently, um, uh, the Spurs in the early 2000s. So like, or 2000s, 2010, or the 15-year run they have with Duncan. But th- there's still interest in the sport. Is like when teams are dominating, like they have an inch on the past, right? Like obviously this has happened before. The, the Canadians in the 70s, uh, the Oilers in the 80s, uh, that gets the Red Wings in the 2000s, that period. Is, like, is that... Is parody actually better? Like, I'm actually curious as your guys' thoughts. On, like, I like I like where you're guys. going with this, but you could also say, like, in the NHL, we call them modern day dynasties. For instance, the Chicago Blackhawks they won three championships over the course of what, guys, six years? Uh, five. Uh, well, 2010, okay, 13, and 15. So yeah. six, yeah. Okay, so six, so six years. I consider that That's a dynasty, a dynasty to, in hockey, okay. and especially in hockey because it is so hard to repeat, given the grueling aspect of playoffs, how deep you go, and how you have to replenish because of that hard cap. I would also consider uh, maybe on the edge, LA Kings as a modern day dynasty because they won won two in that period, and then also the Tampa Bay Lightning because they they won the President's Trophy, uh, got knocked out first round, but then they won back to back, and then they went to the Stanley Cup Finals, like for. For me, those three teams are the probably the three that stand out the most within the most re- recent period of time. But nothing like the old days where you're seeing four in a row. Like I, I would, I could almost guarantee you that you would, I would put a million bucks on it that you're never ever going to see another NHL team win even three Stanley Cups. I agree. In a row. I would agree. you guys I want? Well, like, but if that happened, you'd be like, this is. You would be very excited about it. I oh, would yeah. suck off the GM. How about oh, yeah. that? It would How about be, that? Let's make I mean, a little prop bet Tampa here. making it to that third straight final was was a story in itself. The parity level for me, I I think it's a positive only because when you get to the first round of the playoffs in the NHL and you almost see a dip in the second and third round sometimes in terms of entertainment, but I I, I think the two weeks of the first round of the NHL might be the best two weeks in sports okay. because. The eighth seed has a legitimate chance. We saw it with Tampa losing to Columbus in that incredible run after their President's Trophy. And last year, we saw the Bruins become the greatest regular season team ever and lose in the first round. So it's like that part of it makes the first round that uh, impressive and also entertaining with the NHL. So that part of the parody, I I do enjoy. And also, I think that through any sport, like the goaltending position and all of a sudden playoff time mm. becomes so important and valuable where if, if all of a sudden guys got, you know, if, if he's got a rabbit up his ass, like Bobrovsky ended up getting called in what game three or four. And then he just went on this crazy run. So that's also an element to it. Um, but are you done with your hockey questions, Trunk? Cause I was going to come back at you. Yeah. I got one more, but I just okay. want for the record, I don't want you guys clipping this out. <laughs> Biz said that he would suck off the GM if they won three in a row. Biz has we said many things. We're not posting that many online. Things. We'll just okay. keep it. We'll keep it podcast. We won't okay. be clipping that. Yeah, we won't clip it. No, uh, <laughs> no. The other thing that I had was that my last NHL related question was about uh, uh, what you're talking about. The offseason is not as sexy because of the structure, as you know, having this crazy, uh, you know. In the NBA, uh, Adrian Wojciechowski and Shams uh, Terania are like oh, yeah. the basically they're almost bigger than the sport in a way, right? Woj yeah. bombs, Sham bombs is like huh. they're announcing the big trade, the big free agent signing, and they despise each other and they hate each other, right? Oh, it's it an makes it better. Oh, dude, oh, it's, it's oh, dude. Wow. So we're talking about you're talking with CZ Binance uh, uh, with uh, uh, Sam uh, Brayman Freed, you know, mentor mentee relationship. If you didn't know this, Adrian Wojciechowski hired Shams. Uh, to Yahoo Sports. There's always Adrian a connection the, there. There's always a connection. But I was reading... Uh, anyways, the reason I bring that up is like... It's ever since I have my kids specifically. My kids are five and a half, almost six years old. And I just have less time for sports now. And sports in general. Like I've gone... Basketball is basically the only sport I can even really watch anymore. And even then, I'm basically just watching YouTube highlights and following the game on Twitter, right? Like the the story, the game of the game. Like You're the like any game. fifteen year old fan. They don't watch games. They just watch yeah, highlights. I've turned into one of I've turned into one of those. And uh but the question I have is because that aspect is kind of taken away, uh you guys are such commentators on the league. It's like, does that bother you? 
um, because there's that less. I mean, there's a there's a. You know what where- bothers me about it is the fact that the NHL and I believe the MLB was the same. They might have changed their thinking. They won't allow us to share clips because we don't pay for rights. How else are you going to grow the game uh, to the younger generation? Yeah. Considering they're all in, like that's one thing. If we had Bettman on, I'd be like, why don't you let it? Every time we post a clip, they're trying to like they'll they'll flag our account. Where it's like, where do you think the kids are coming to watch what the hell's going on in the National Hockey League? So take the clips away. You're just hurting yourself, in my opinion. I don't so give a flying the, fuck. I, I agree with that. Um, the one thing that the NBA has mastered is creating their storylines are individuals. And, and and that takes away from the team aspect. And that is the complete opposite of the history of hockey and kind of what it's built around in terms of team teamwork and, and, and being a part of like, and having your teammates uh, just care about you as much as you care about them. But the NBA has gone to individuals. I do think the NHL is starting to like turn a corner a little bit in terms of like really propping up individual players because with like the current youth and how they watch things, they're almost more into exact players as opposed to teams. So the more the NHL does that, while it takes away from like the history of the game and being on a team, it probably is good in the long run for the growth of the sport. Uh, absolutely. And I, I just want to say, though, oh, you're talking about uh, athletes and uh, popularity. Great episode with Charles Barkley. That was amazing. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you that buddy. was all biz setting that up. Thanks, Trung. Yeah, that's my boy, Charles. Um, I was going to shift it. Well, there's a couple more things we want to talk to you about is the whole Costco clothing business, as well as the golf business with Costco. Now, there were some numbers that came out recently, and you'll know them all, just an astronomical amount of money that they're bringing in through selling their own clothes and just generic stuff in general. Do you, uh, well, Whit mentioned pre-call. Whit, do you, do you use Kirkland golf balls? I do not. Um, I do not use them, but I've been told by people that when they're released within minutes, they're gone. And then they're resold at crazy, like up, upticks. Okay. So I'm going to explain to you guys about the Kirkland brand, which I think you'll appreciate. Does everybody here have a Costco membership? I do. I don't. Okay. I've never been this. in, but my wife frequents it. <laughs> You need it's there. It's much different for uh, obviously when you have larger families. It's a th- it's you got to have a Costco member. Asians. I don't need a hundred granola bars <laughs> with the way that I travel and like I'm good. Okay, so uh, fair enough. But I'll hit you with some numbers about Costco. There you go. Costco sizes. Costco is one of the most fascinating businesses in the world, and they're a monster. Come so they're the, I think I believe that's the third largest retailer in the world. They did 223 billion last year. Okay, but here's the key. They, wit as you well know, you go in there, you'll get a 15 can uh, pound can of tuna for like two bucks or no. like a five pound jug of mayo for like five bucks, right? I don't the even green- eat dinner sometimes. <laughs> I just send my wife in there and she brings out all the samplings. Get the samplings, right? So it's like the greatest deals and the beauty about Costco, why they're able to get these deals is A, like if you work, your supplier to Costco, you know you're going to get volume. You're guaranteed volume. So you're willing to take a, a margin cut uh, to do the volume. And Costco has a very strict code. They will never have a product that they'll mark up more than 15%. Most are under five. They just want the customers to be happy. And the reason is this. I, when I asked you about the membership, that's the reason. They So I told you that $223 billion, uh, they sold in products. But in profit wise, 70% of their profit comes from membership fees. No because way. Because membership fees are almost... Membership is almost pure margin. It's like it seems well, simple then. Me? Yeah, it, it, that's the thing, right? Amazon Prime, Jeff Bezos literally copied Amazon Prime after speaking to the founder of Costco. And the thing is, once you buy and become a member of a place, like either you do Prime or Costco, you're more likely to go to Costco. You want to quote unquote get your money's worth. So you're incentive, you're psychologically incentivized to go to Costco. So I pay 60 bucks for my annual membership. I'll spend way more there than I have to because I think everything's a deal. And everything is a deal because as we mentioned, they do so much volume. They only work with like a couple thousand suppliers. So when you go to Costco store, they have 4,000 SKUs. That's stock keeping units. That's everything we mentioned. Uh, Tuna, you know, toothpaste, milk, 4,000. That's not a lot. Walmart has 50,000 SKUs. Yeah, normal grocery stores are between like 40 and 60,000. So you go there and you're like, ah, what kind of ketchup? There's 17 different ketchups. You know, there's like one, right? 
Yeah, and they, they get rid of paradox. There's no paradox of choice. That, that's a, a popular term in consumer psychology. It's like, if you go and you see 17 ketchups, you're so confused, you just might not even walk out with any. You're like, fuck it. Yeah. This is way too confusing. <laughs> you go to Costco, there's one five-pound jug of mayo. That's all you're going to get. Uh, Heinz are a bust when it comes to ketchup. But uh, I want to ask, uh, why are store brands pretty much always like inferior? Mo more so with food. You know, like, yeah. I know they're cheaper, but they, they always seem to be just a little bit off. No, that was uh, good. that's Instagram. So my kid actually just uh, walked in here and said, Daddy, you swore. So, <laughs> so Dad, <laughs> okay. I'm not going to stop swearing. Yeah. That's better right, than him just repeating the word. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to shut the bleep up. The lunatic. Yeah. No, but, uh, but R.A., right, I'll, uh, I'll answer your question by talking At least you didn't promise to suck off a general manager. <laughs> Three. <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds like it's impossible. That sounds like a non-promise, really, right? It doesn't sound like it's going to happen. But R.A., right, so Kirkland, going back to Kirkland uh, Golf Balls, Kirkland is an in-house brand for Costco. Mm -hmm. And to your point, unlike some other popular in-house brands that may have a lower reputation, Kirkland forces the supplier. So they're, I think they might, the, the whoever's making those golf balls, it might actually be just Titleist. It might actually be one of the it, largest. So apparently it, it is Titleist. Yes. Now so we're TaylorMade, we're TaylorMade podcast, but people have said it's like a pro V1 right. with Kirkland on it. But basically, they so the company they work with two things. They had to promise never to tell that they're working with Costco, because Costco's like, we're listen, it's Kirkland brand, right? It's our brand that we own, and Kirkland is a uh, because it's called Kirkland because there's Kirkland in Washington State, which is where Costco's from. There's a Kirkland uh, city, so Kirkland Signature. They're not like these uh, white label brands uh, already that you mentioned. They are the best because they're going to title list allegedly, mm -hmm. or they're going to Levi Strauss, which many people believe is making the Kirkland clothing. And they're saying, hmm. we can guarantee you the most insane volume, but if you do it, we control the entire experience and you have to make your product actually better on one dimension. So actually, the if you go play the golf ball, people might even say it's better than the title is. It's because Costco is forcing them to do that. Whatever that huh. uh, metric might be, it could be like... Uh, maybe weight per distance or whatever random metric they pick. Like they might go to somebody, make, uh, somebody making almonds and be like, yeah, we want our almonds to test better with this group. They have to test better. We're not going to use them. Right. And they are making actually a brand that people love and already to answer your question. That's why they're able to pull it because of the volume. So they're selling over $50 billion a year in Kirkland brand to wow. give you an idea of that wow. scale. That's like Nike level. So Holy Kirkland shit, is doing really? Nike numbers. Nine and billion in clothing as well. Correct? Nine billion just in the clothing. Lululemon does eight did eight billion last year. They were just tell you how big Kirkland is. Kirkland sold more clothing. Costco sold more clothing. Kirkland brand and also some like random like high school brands that we all probably used to all wear. Gap, Bubbles. Ralph Lauren, you know the classics. Uh, they're able to scoop those up on what's called the gray market. So a lot of the clothing manufacturers aren't able to get rid of all their inventory. It finds their ways into different pockets of retail and Costco just kind of buys them all up. And the beauty about Costco, and let me give you one quote before you guys want to follow up with any questions about Kirkland, because I know you got some, is uh, so the, the founder of Costco, his name is Jim Senegal. This is the guy that is the quote machine. Have you guys heard the quote about if you change the price of the hot dog combo, yeah. I'll fucking kill you. Yeah. So <laughs> for your listeners that don't know, when, uh, the, uh, the, when uh, Jim Senegal left as Costco CEO in the early 2010s, he uh, uh, gave it to another individual who's at Costco for three decades uh, at that point. And then one day the guy comes in, he's like, hey man, he's like, you know, the Costco com, the hot dog com was still a buck 50. It's like with inflation, we've kept it the same for 30 years. It should really be four bucks. And Jim Senegal just goes, if you change the price of the hot dog combo, I'll fucking kill you. And like, that's the <laughs> legendary lore, right? But he actually had another great quote about clothing. So one time they were able to get a bunch of these Calvin Klein jeans and uh, retail uh, price or uh, from wholesalers like 28 bucks. They negotiated down to 21. And he's speaking in front of MIT students. He's like, he's like, you know how tempting it was for me to keep that $7 extra on every jeans? But then he goes, once you take that extra margin, it's like taking heroin. You can't stop. So like, he's like, I'm not taking the extra dollars because it's too easy and it'll just warp the company and like our values. So uh, the last thing I'll say about Costco is they announced a new CEO last week. You guys are going to laugh. His name is Ron Vacris, and he started at Costco in the 1980s as a forklift driver. That's, that's the American dream. Right that's, that. that's leadership. <laughs> that's yeah. leadership. I love exactly. That stuff. He's done everything. Forklift driver, working on the floor, uh, cashier, just the whole nine, right? He knows the company front to back. So he's yep. going to be CEO Gen 1.
Because of your, uh, your Twitter, I know there's a forklift competition where guys wheel around on forklifts. And this, what is it? Like some basically a competition they hold, right? A bunch of forklifts. In Germany, yeah. That place. should be on the, I think that's on the Ocho. <laughs> that's why. That's why. ESPN Ocho? You mean yeah, from oh. Costco? It's all the Costco people doing No, no, wait. No, it was just... a completely random German forklift championship thing. Oh, okay. Always, uh, well, uh, Chung, just, I mean, we, we have so much more, but we seriously. almost want to save it. It won't be a year before you yeah. come on again. What's Can up, I just is? ask two quick ones? Um, the uh, you, you had a thread on how George Lucas kept the Star Wars IP in the seventies. Now, can like R- R- RAs? You guys a big want movie. me? I can I can do super quick if you guys want. It's, yeah, uh, give us the Coles notes on that one. Please. Okay, the super Coles note is uh, uh I know R is a big uh, Hollywood guy. Uh, big Jeff Star Wars guy uh, yeah. works with uh, yeah, a big Star Wars guy. No, just basically the TLDR with George is like it's probably considered the greatest deal in Hollywood history. So he uh, have you guys seen American Graffiti? Uh, that was uh, George Lucas's uh, first movie about as well as youth in California. Unexpected hit. He went to the studio and uh, afterwards and went, uh, "Hey, I want to make this movie about a, a it's a space opera." This is what, how he described it. And the space opera was ended up becoming Star Wars. And they're like, "Okay, we'll pay you five hundred thousand dollars to direct it." Uh, he's like, "No, no, no. How about this? I'll take a three hundred fifty thousand dollar pay cut. So I want one hundred fifty thousand dollars, but you will give me merchandise and sequel rights." And the reason they gave those up is this is the 70s. And it's not like it is now where, you know, when you go watch a Disney movie, walk out the store, there's 50 different dolls of that that toy. He had the foresight to be like, okay, if this is going to be huge, I want to make so much money off of everything else. And sure enough, that one deal he made uh, when he sold... Uh, di- when he sold Star uh, Lucasfilms to uh, Disney uh, in 2007, I believe, for $4 billion, he became a 2% shareholder in Disney. He was the largest single shareholder in Disney. A uh, second God largest. Damn. You know who's largest? Steve Jobs, who sold really? Pixar to Disney. Steve Jobs owned 4% of, uh, of Disney. I think to this day, his wife, Lorene Powell Jobs, after uh, she inherited the estate, is the largest single shareholder of Disney. So the whole point of this story is that uh, George Lucas made one deal betting on himself. And the crazy thing about all that is the uh, the merchandise is where all the money came from in the end. They sold, I think, $20 billion in toys, $10 billion in games, $5 billion in comic strips. It's just unbelievable, right? And it literally, he took a $350,000 pay cut to do it. And he knew the characters in the movie would end up being like the best part of it. So then you're, you're selling the figurines. Exactly. What a genius idea. Totally crazy. Nobody thought about it before because in the 70s, people weren't making sequels. They weren't doing yeah. like this Marvel thing. It was very unexpected at the time. Yeah, but, the uh, action figures weren't too big either at, at the time. They, they, he really kind of put them on the map with that. I still have a few left. You could go ahead, Biz. I know you had another question. No, I, well, the, I, I think we've gone a little bit long. The only other one yeah. I had was the, the uh, who's the director of Interstellar? Oh, Christopher Nolan. Chris Nolan. Christopher Nolan on you how. You know what? Why don't, we, why don't we come back for the next one, a whole Nolan thing? Because I got there hours go. on Nolan, man. Oh, okay. buddy, you're, you're unbelievable. Oh, this you're is even legend. better than the first time. Everyone, if if you have not, Check Tim out on Twitter. I want to get this correct. Why don't you let everyone know the 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 handle? At Trunk T Fan. I just want to, I cannot thank you guys enough. I, I know this is running a bit longer than pre-scheduled, but I had a blast with you guys and uh, would love for this not to do every year. But if we got uh, more often, it'd be no, great, man. No, love we'll to. be back Absolutely. before a year. Promise you that. So we appreciate it, Trung, and keep crushing it. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Big thanks for Trunk for jumping on with us, man. He's a great guy. I love his threads. I love the one on Tom Cruise biz. I don't know if you ever saw it. It's all his craziest stunts and like a, it's like fifteen friggin' videos. Unbelievable that stuff that Tom Cruise has done over the years. So, thanks again, Trunk. We'll see you soon, my friend. It's time, biz, to grind my gears, baby. Brought to you by Big Deal Brewing dot com slash finder. And you know what grinds my gears, and it's kind of sad, biz, is what I see numbers. A, yeah, that too. Oh my God, I <laughs> count to three backwards. As I see a a, a, a a pretty woman, a pretty lady, whatever, oh, it doesn't have to be necessarily pretty, and they have those big fucking Mr. Limpid fish lips because they inject this shit into the lips. Oh, man. this is a good uh, one. It's I and it's like what you know what do you I don't understand why people do that. It looks at a certain point you fucking look like a bluefish that just got pulled from Boston Harbor across the street. I don't know why women do it, man. Like there's natural beauty. Trump's the fake shit all day. Uh, I am a boob guy, but I'd rather a, a fucking uh, an A than fucking fake D's. I mean, I just don't understand why the lips, though. Like you, it's so obvious you put in fucking whatever they put in your lips, biz. It's I don't know. It drives my gears, ladies. Just keep them the same. That's the way you were made. Don't put that shit in your lips. Everyone's gonna know it's fucking fake. 
Keep it real. Fucking keep it natural, biz. That's my. Take. Well, I mean, the four like girls, them? the four girls that listen to our <laughs> podcast chew. They don't inject their lips or get fake tits. They're working. They're probably in a, in a tractor right now. Uh, uh, you know, grooming their crops. Um, Ari, I, I agree completely. I think that the internet has fried a lot of people's brains. They think that that equates to beauty. The worst part about it is the side angle. If they saw how stupid they looked from the side, but some of them do it like subtly where it's not too bad, but some of them just inject them out the nines and it looks absolutely ridiculous. So it looks like it, they could suck a golf ball through a garden hose. I think that the Kardashians made this oh. a popular thing and along with the ass implants and tit implants and then you name it. Uh, horrible trend. Uh, hope it ends. And I agree. It's not It's yeah. not beautiful. It's and fake looking. And the looking. craziest thing is once you do it once, you got to do it the rest of your life. So yeah. it's like... I think girls like how the it looks in can, in like pictures from the face on view, but like yeah, from the side it's a disaster. It's uh, there's probably some women you've seen with lips that have had it done, but it doesn't look like you know like they, yeah, let's be said like subtly or they've had a good doctor do it. I don't know, but it, it is bizarre when you see the botched ones. You're like oh, you just feel so bad because they can't really go back once they've started that. It's it's not a good look. All right, once again, ladies. Keep it natural. You're all beautiful. You don't have to do that shit. Grind My Gears brought to you by BigDealBrewing.com slash finder. Uh, one other note, get well, Jackie Hughes. We hate to see what happened. He crashed in the boards last week. It was pretty ugly stuff. He had taken a hit from uh, versus the Capitals a little before that, too. I hope it's not a fucking head knock, but get well soon, Jackie. We miss you out there. Got to have you back out in the ice. Uh, ugly sweaters, G. They all, they went on sale, I believe, yesterday. Uh, when are they on sale for good now? I know it was a twenty four hour sale. What's the what's the latest on that? Yeah, so we have a twenty four hour sale right going on right now. So when this podcast is live, the sale will not be live. But one cool thing that Dave has initiated this year with the ugly sweater sale is if we go over our goal, all of the money that we go over our goal will be then split and divided amongst behind the scenes people at Barstool Sports. So producers, editors, social media people. All these different people, guys on our team, would get a little payday. So buy the buy the uh, ugly sweaters. Um, it's going to go to a good cause. We have this awesome pink Whitney one. We have the Big Deal Brewing one. We have a Chicklets one. So check them out, barstoolsports.com slash Chicklets. All right. Uh, the last one we have here, uh, the WHL made uh, net guard protection mandatory last week. The new rule went into effect Friday or as soon as the gear is available to all teams. Uh, teams need to wear it in practice in the games. The OHL and Q had already made them mandatory back in the day. Uh, the Penguins said they're going to be making it mandatory for uh, Wilkes, Barry, Scranton, and Wheeling. Uh, what I know, we want to go to you on this. T.J. Oshie had a, had a, a little uh, press conference, not really a press conference, a scrum rather, and he said he was doing it for his kids and, and his family because you know why not? The guys just avoid him because the the you know the look, how it looks or how it feels. Why don't guys? Uh, they seem I, to be I, reluctant I for this. For, for a long time, it was you know how it looks, and nobody wore one, and you know nobody wore a half shield. And now you're thinking back, like I can't believe that. Like, there's six guys left who don't wear a half shield because the rule was grandfathered in, and now you come into the league, you have a half shield. And I, I do hope, and I guess just getting older and realizing like something that's preventable. I hope that at some point the NHL adopts you, you have a neck guard on, and, and it sounds crazy to say, but. It is about look, and there is some comfort involved, but guys get used to stuff. And and I, I first thing I did when that, that horrible tragedy went down is I ordered Ryder a shirt. I went to OSHA's company, War Road. They were sold out. They actually make a shirt that has uh, the built-in neck guard and the built-in wrist guards. Um, I ordered Ryder. Uh, so they were sold out, but I got a Bauer one. Um and then I ordered them some socks too that that are that are cut resistant. Going to try to find some wrist things, and it's just like the game's fast. And and if you could maybe prevent something and 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 save your life, it's like what are we doing not wearing them? So you'd like to see USA Hockey make them mandatory. I know it's mandatory in Canada. I like seeing the junior leagues do it. And I think a lot of a lot of parents out there, first thing they did was tr try to get their sons or daughters uh, some neck protection. So it, it's. It, it, the, the NHL game and, and, and high-level hockey is so fast, but the kids, I mean, they're jumping on each other and they do the pig piles and they don't know their bodies. They don't know where their legs are. And it's just kind of a no-brainer to me that, that, that kids have them on and wear them. And I wouldn't have said that years ago. They're a lot different, too, than they are, than they used to be. And I think the cool thing oh, it is... Oh, used to be is, the plastic ones and stuff. Oh, the eye tech, though. They were the yeah. most itchy things in the world. But I think it's really cool to see all the companies now are making a huge initiative to figure figure out the issue. 
just figure it out where they need to find something comfortable that works for everyone. Uh, Bauer was one in particular that released a statement how they're going to de- dedicate all this time, energy, and money to it. So yeah, I think it's it's great to see that people are making a change here. Also, what uh, that was a nice tribute. Uh, Nottingham Forest versus Aston Villa. Uh, was that uh, Nottingham's home stadium? They, they paused the game at the 47-minute mark. Uh, they held the flag up, gave him a standing ovation. I thought that was a really nice tribute. Yeah. You know, not something you, you usually see over in England, but I, I thought they did a great job with that. So, uh, boys, hey, any final thoughts uh, before we wrap it up here? I don't have no, to do excited for numbers. California. Um, <laughs> can't wait to get out there, getting some nice weather, hopefully, and, and, and meet some fans in the Anaheim area. Grinelli mentioned where we'll be. Hopefully we see some guys. We got some fun sandbaggers coming up and some interviews. And and what's nice is we'll be together uh, for the podcast recording next week. So I always love being in the same room. Seems like the show's uh, a little more fun. And, and and here we go. And it is now four to four, Tampa Bay, Toronto. By the way. Oh shit! Wow. Okay, well, yeah. Matthews got two. I just tweeted it out. I said thank God for Austin Matthews. Two <laughs> goals and an assist. The guy's lighting the lamp right now. Uh, my Croke final thoughts are uh, thank you to Hockey Night in Canada. Subscribe to our YouTube channel over 300K. <laughs> um, thank God for Austin Matthews. And um, give us your feedback on on the Trung fan stuff. Like we want to continue to get uh, like outside of just NHL or hockey players on the podcast. We like interviewing people who you know can talk and, and educate us on other things as well. So we want to know what you guys think. And I'm sure you guys are going to love that one. And the last thing I will say is R.A., it's the year of the warthog. I know you were battling the numbers today, but you're the fucking glue guy. We love you. And let's give him Dang a couple bite. clicks for the season he's having, folks. The year of the hog. We love you. We'll see you next week in California. Peace. Deuces.